meeting to order, uh, what is the date? February 20th, 2018. This uh, is our agenda review workshop, and all are present. And we welcome the guests who are here also. And those who don't usually get to come from staff. So this is exciting. <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm going to turn this over to yes, Mr. Davis to go through the agenda. Thank you, and good morning. Thank you for the uh, uh, start of the meeting off. I think it's appropriate. Uh, as you know, uh, last week is a hard time for everyone in this nation, especially when uh, you know you see kids and, and educators involved. This, like I said in the message to everyone, this is a, a school should be a place that uh, should be a place where people feel loved and supported and, and cared for. It's uh, protected, and we'll continue to do that in Clay County every day. So thank you. Today's a heavy, honestly heavy agenda, so i got staff here to, to help us through it so that uh, we can answer any questions that you may have, and um, after today, I, will, I hope we'll use the next probably 10 days to, to interact with each of you in order for us to come to a part where we understand or have the best plans ready to go for the school board meeting, so I'll do my best with everything. First one is C1, which is our minutes for our January 23rd student here, along with February 1st work, um, uh, regular meeting in the workshop on the 12th. The only thing I wanted to um, say is the electronic record of my, one of my votes on the first was not correct, but in the minutes it's reflected correctly. If you watch okay. the video, it's correct. It, it, so I was um, wanting to get consensus if Ms. Bush and I could fix that electronically so that the electronic record reflects that. Absolutely. Yes. 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 Thank you. Yes, ma'am. C2 is the proper plan. Yes, Ms. Bush, you'll repost the correct minutes then for the approval for the regular yes. meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. C2 is proclamation for the Clay County Agricultural Fair. Mm -hmm. So we'll have uh, Tasha B, the general manager, be here to accept this proclamation and probably say a few words about our partnership. <coughs> C3 is the uh, Florida Youth Challenge Academy Student Employee Work Calendar for 1819. It is very similar to the 1718 work calendar. C4 is the, uh, the establishment and acknowledgement of Teacher Appreciation Week in Clay County. We know that May 7th through the 11th is the week that we've identified, and the state and is National Week. And then May 8th will be the day that we, we celebrate it in Clay County as a single day. Every day is Teacher Appreciation C5 is Administrative Professionals Week. Uh, that will be slated for April 22nd through the 28th, and we will identify April 21st as the Administrative Professional Day in Clay County. C6 is personnel consent agenda. There is nothing on here that I believe that, uh, that is um, you know, uh, unusual. So, uh, Mr. Broski, anything that you believe that's the same? No, sir. Of course, we'll add more people get hired every day, so we'll add new people out there to have an accurate reflection before the board meeting, 48 hours before the board meeting. C7, um, I put this here, and I'm, it may need to go to discussion. Um, so I will let the, uh, the board determine whether or not uh, this is uh, something we want to put on discussion. This is proposed supplemental changes. At this time, I have uh, I've, I've recommended one adjustment in this package, and this uh, is to, uh, as, as you know, we spent around $2.7 million on supplements. That's academic supplements, ac athletic supplements for, um, for our, our employees. Uh, my recommendation here is to remove the supplement for department heads. And this is around uh, $698,000. Um, rationale is because uh, we have moved uh, far beyond uh, needing one single individual to kind of be the conduit between administrative staff and uh, in our teaching force. We've moved to uh, professional learning communities where it's all-inclusive mentality, where every one of the teachers in the content area are bringing something to the table. This doesn't negate the fact that department heads have been awesome. The problem is, is department heads have an, it's an outdated model that kind of stifles, um, stifles leadership growth internally. Uh, we see that uh, we've had increased collaborations. Sorry, and there's no longer need for, like I said, <coughs> the PLC model is truly a model where everyone's inclusive and everyone's a part of the, the planning process through administration and through our, our teachers as they look to identify item specs, lead the work, identify techs, they all have, uh, they're all involved in this process. 
I will tell you around $2,200 goes to department heads in our school district, and um, that impacts around 285 employees, I would say, 285, 287. And I believe, uh, in, in if I'm not allowed to say this, please tell me, I believe this money, uh, I'm trying to be proactive, and I think this money can go and help on the insurance side, is $700,000. Is there anything in our CCA contract that prevents you from doing that? No, ma'am. Um, as superintendent, I can uh, remove, um, um, remove supplements. The one thing that's in contract that I have to work uh, with in, within the contract is negotiated, and Ms. Piper, please help me, uh, is just negotiate on pay. The actual cost of the supplement. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Have you yes, spoken with any of the principals about this? We've had conversations with, with principals about it and APs. Mm -hmm. and, and they've uh, said that they don't require department heads, let's say, in the elementary curriculum. In the elementary well, I, from, the, from the side of their leadership, they believe that it's, it's an all-inclusive uh, it's all inclusive model. Even when I asked uh, administrators, what are your department heads doing? Well, they're helping us with textbooks. They're helping us. I mean, that's something administrator staff can do. Um, they're helping us with uh, building, I mean, they build agendas for the, the PLCs, but that's an inclusive model. They all agree about what they're going to focus on, what they bring to the table and they work collectively on that part. Having been a department head, I would beg to differ that being responsible for textbooks, for instance, and walking into my classroom at the end of the summer when there are boxes upon right. boxes and distributing textbooks, making certain that all the textbooks are recorded, um, scanned, etc., to the individual teachers. Um, Yes, the teachers do a lot of their own, but there is a lot of management right. of that as well. Um, department heads, even, and I, granted I've been out of the classroom for a year now, so you may have changed a lot of things, but from a personal perspective, I know that we were the people that probably were that first contact with the principal also, sounding board, for want of a better word. Um, there was a lot that was from advising um, and advising new teachers, even though there are mentors and coaches and things of that nature. Frequently the department head is the person that a lot of people go to and other department heads go to to discuss problems. Um, I'm not saying to it, get rid of department heads. I'm just saying remove, remove a supplement. And I believe administrator can take books. That supplement is... That's okay. Counted on. It is. It's something that's earned. And, 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 and I, I believe mean, it's not. It's not a simple task. Sure. It's not, I, I'm. I'm sitting here trying to put right. more work to do this conversation. Do y'all feel the push of this? Yes, please. Yes. Yes. If you will this item to the discussion. And my only bring to it is not to negate the fact that department heads don't work hard, but I believe that it's more of an inclusive model that we have now through the PLCs. And that we can impact greater a greater number of individuals with seven hundred thousand dollars versus two hundred eighty. Chris, okay, go ahead. Okay. Somehow it just lost me. Hey, anybody else? We'll talk about it. Okay. At the board. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you. Um, C8 is approval of out-of-county travel. We've had a number of competitions that our schools have been going to, so my apologies in advance for some of these uh, being kind of late, but we have some ROTC competitions that they qualify uh, really late on, so either, there's a couple of, in January that uh, with, with NJROTC to show that the individuals are going to individual academic competitions and championships as well. C9 is a master master plan for in-service. This should be renewed on an annual basis. It is my understanding it has not been re renewed in the last five or six years, but none, regardless, we're, we're, this is ready and roll, ready for print now. This is a master, this is for master and professional points, which defines our procedures about how teachers are awarded points for professional development. Uh, we did something, uh, we did a crosswalk in here for backup that shows old language versus new language so that you'll be able to see the, uh, the interaction with this document. And it's just a developed plan for PD so teachers truly understand and know how to, um, uh, how, how to identify points, how to complete registration, and um, how to look at uh, bankable points for uh, recertification. Yes, Was PDAC involved with this? 
professional no. development. That's what I'm just going to say. We have contractual language, and PDEP has to be involved in the advisory. It is the advisory council to this uh, in-service plans, and we have not had a meeting all year and have not been involved whatsoever. And uh, the other thing is we have passed this every year. Um, we usually pass it at the beginning of the year or right at the end of the year, but we have passed the master in-service because that has to go to PDEP first. And it's always done. It is an advisory, but it has its own bylaws, and we have very strict bylaws in PDEP that's been approved by this board, <coughs> and we have not followed any of those for the last year. And I will say that um, the, the state actually has just recently, Ms. Ms. Waller, not here, recently has adjusted all the requirements in, in this plan. So if we would have uh, developed a plan in the last two or three months and, and brought it to the board, we'd have had to revise it and develop it a, again. So we're glad we kind of, and, and this has been a pause. I will make sure that we get with Ms. Piva to today, immediately with Mrs. Mrs. Moeller. My assumption is that she's had extensive conversation about a, it. We have a big PDAP council yeah. mm -hmm. that, you know, I've asked about. Um, we have not met. We have bylaws that requires us to meet mm -hmm. in these timelines timelines and agree to the good service master plan that's presented to this board and none of that has happened. Is this time sensitive? Is this something that should be pushed back? Um, I think it is time sensitive given the fact that it's been, um, the state's been in and out uh, with uh, with new requirements, so we're just trying to push it so that we, we have it approved by the board. I'll ask Katie Moore to reach out to the Department of Education again, and uh, along with Ms. Piva, and determine whether or not it can be pushed to uh, to our next month. Mm -hmm. uh, if not, if, we, if I need to call something, I'll get Ms. Piva to see if we can call an immediate, immediate emergency meeting so that we can go through um, all of this information. Thank you. If yes, all this does not work out, you post on Friday, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll know. We'll know. I, I have a note. We'll know today. I mean, if it's, if it's it's still going up there uh, and it's not worked out by Thursday, we'll move it. We'll, we'll push, push it back. We'll, we'll push it back. Because this doesn't sound like, you know, you yeah. need to be back for the yeah. We need to make sure we've got our T's crossed and our I's crossed. And, yeah. okay. and those are those cross it's, it's It's a better document than it's been. So I haven't revised in six years. Or so. So. Okay, so we'll just... C10 is an amendment with Santa Fe dual enrollment articulation. This is our movement to help Keystone uh, High School uh, receive an accelerated, an accelerated <laughs> program for academics. This is now with it, where now we have opportunity for 10th graders to take uh, college courses. Uh, as, as we started 15 months ago, we wanted to put an acceleration program in every one of our high schools, and this will be the final opportunity. So it would be all in, in you know great work between. Um, to uh, Mr. Connor, Mr. Kirikas has, has worked through this process, and uh, this allows us to move forward with a college, high school, um, uh, co collegiate high school mentality. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Connor it's not hard. quite as as good as it could be. You're right. That's, not that that's, that's actually right. accurate. Right. We've, so we 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 do. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, frustration, it's been tough. the frustration is there's the the county built a sidewalk so that kids could walk, mm -hmm. but Santa Fe doesn't want younger kids on their campus, mm -hmm. and they're being difficult about that. And so now we're trying to figure out how to get teachers dual certified, and it's just a mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had to work I, hard for this. But I do appreciate yeah. the effort that's been done. Good. And I'm sure the parents do. Good. As, soon as, it, as soon as they find out. <laughs> <laughs> the this program leads for an AA, so yeah. we're excited about yeah. it. And they do a good that's job, 11th, 12th graders, but 10th graders, it gets, a, it gets a, an opportunity. We want a ninth, but we, we, we <coughs> settle on 10th. And you know, Keystone has more <coughs> dual enrollment uh -huh. associates degrees than any Anyone. other school. Absolutely. Actually, more than all the other schools combined, that's Keystone correct. has the most. So I'm glad to see you're just pushing yep. it. It's good. It's an exciting time. Uh, Thanks to Keystone. Yes, ma'am. C11, this is um, C11, this is articulation agreement with uh, with the county commission, did they bring the contract? Excuse me? The contract for the resource officers yet? No, okay. um, we I'm may have to, I've yeah. reached out to them, they have not, so we may be pulling it on the next agenda. Item. So we're just, we've been working with uh, the sheriff in the, in the county in order to close our agreement and our contract for resource officers. Uh, there was some uh, uh, increase in funding that we didn't budget for, 
So um, we're very uh, upfront with them and letting them know that uh, you know that we didn't have the funding to, to take where they wanted to go. But they do a good job. I mean, it, it costs around 1.2 million dollars, I believe, a year for them to staff it, and we only get 530 thousand dollars for um, safe and civil schools. So uh, we're working, and uh, we should we have got it down to where we can afford it, and we're good to go. I think that is something for us to kind of pay attention yeah. to on the house floor. A um, a representative who brought um, this, who brought a change to this bill, right. said from this. Now this was prior to the uh, Parkland shooting yes, last week, but he said from the floor that um, schools are spending 80 percent of their safe and civil schools money on uh, resource officers, and that he felt that that was out of line, <coughs> and that that money should be used to fund hope scholarships for the bully, the bully. Right. Bully plan, and so then not a week later, we have a school shooting oh, yeah. with a 43-acre campus and one resource officer. Right. So we'll want to pay attention to that so that we can help our legislative delegation as well as the others to know that that's needed money. Yes, ma'am. In fact, underfunded in my opinion. It is underfunded. We used to be funded by much more. Yes, you're right. We have resources. Officers at the high schools and junior highs. Yeah, oh, yeah. just high schools. Like we cut out junior highs. Yes, and what about elementary? Yes, no, ma'am. So right now this we have resource. So right now we have resource officers in the high school. Uh, the sheriff uh, sought out a grant to put junior high school resource officers. They they were not awarded with it. However, uh, we've been in recent conversations with about how we can work with local legislators and delegates in Tallahassee and me personally with the governor to figure out what we can do for safe. Uh, safe in schools uh, funding in order to create more money for behavior and mental health along with uh, security for our schools. Mm -hmm. well, we Meanwhile, we'll continue to work through um, Dr. Kemp uh, who continues to secure every one of our campuses to the, to the fullest. Yeah. We used to have resource officers <coughs> in the schools yes, and I would hope that we can find maybe a yes, Tallahassee that they'll yeah. yes, see the light out and you know, elementary schools would be wonderful but at least get them back to junior high schools. But, uh, we, um, I, I even like the idea of having resource officers in all of our schools. Yeah. Um, you should also yeah. start with sending, having fences. I love that. We have so many open campuses. We have well, all these well, campuses that true. aren't fenced in whatsoever. When well, I rode by Orange Park High School the other day, I was looking and I was familiar with Well, Orange Park campus. Junior High. And and you can have 15 Junior. different ways and of getting thought, in there. You know, what do you do? Do you put an eight foot, foot fence with wire, uh, right. with barbed wire on the top, and yeah. then it starts looking like a prison? Right. And, uh, and but we've got these yeah. open campuses, and uh, you know, and and you know, I'm one that I'll just say it. I don't, you know, until they change the laws and these assault rifles are, are kept out of the hands of people, those are for war. You know, uh, if you want a gun to protect yourself, find it good. But, uh, and I do think that, you know, that, uh, the mental health issue too, you, know, you can't spot everyone, even when you've got people looking straight. I mean, sometimes it's, it's just a sad situation. I, you know, everything I've read on it, it is just something needs to be done and I applaud the students at Parkland because it looks like they're going to lead the way things that adults have not done. So I'm also yes, glad to have for yes, students. And, and we're working internally to make certain that we're, our, our campuses are protected. Yeah. So we're working with Kemp and Mr. Harbin to, to create strategy for all. Another point from what Betsy was saying, that particular legislator was referring to a, a statute that gave us the money for safe schools but that particular, and he was saying more of this money should have been used for right. mental health. Well, they, and that particular statute literally said this needs to be used for, or the majority of this needs to be used for resource officers. Mm -hmm. And my, I know that there are a lot of concerns about how we could have, how any of us could have possibly seen this in high school prior to the student leaving the school, right. having been expelled. And, it goes right back to, do we have the support that we need in the high school from our guidance staff, from our, and if you want to say mental health in general, the guidance staff is one of the key areas, key right. focus areas, yep. and unfortunately they've been pulled and pulled and pulled yep. for testing. And 
there's I not an opportunity for them to buy these. We don't know the answer, but but that it's time to do one something. thing that's changed you know, we're, we're, we're all in years. I think everybody's reached their breaking point. Okay, let's go on. C12 is approval of the 2018-2019 payroll calendar. Um, I will note in here <coughs> one adjustment in the payroll calendar is in December, whereas uh, I know that we give um, two checks back to back in December, and I've heard a number of people complain about they'd rather have it every two weeks. So in December you'll get one in the end, uh, the middle of December, one in December versus in December you get one in the first week and then the next week you get another one and then you go an entire month without a paycheck. So um, just a better way of, uh, <laughs> you have five of me, <laughs> but, you know, a better way to, to make certain that every two weeks there's a consistent measure so people can count that money versus front loading it at the beginning and trying to, you know, to budget for 30 days. It could be hard for people and they've expressed Are we concerns. going to share that information, the email to every employee? Everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember, remember when we yes. had? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Everybody needs to be prepared to know that next Christmas they're not getting double paychecks. Right. Because Before that may be Christmas. their Christmas money. Right. So that yeah. needs to go out now and again in September every and month. again in December so that <laughs> well, every month. So no, seriously, January. because some people are counting on that yeah. for their Christmas so shopping. It's a, it's a, it's a big well, deal. Yeah. Yeah. So, the date, I'm sorry, the so dates, I wish it's, it's, it's following a regular calendar that we've done throughout the year. So, it's every the first and the, uh, the, the 15th and the 31st or 30th of the month. So, in, in December, there was that lack in, in the whole month from after the second week of December through January 15th, so it's a huge gap. Mm -hmm. So what we try to do is really just follow the regular payroll calendar as everyone's used to doing the um, the 15th and the 30th or 31st of the month. And I feel like we now just, by notifying the employees now. You no, know, Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah. Santa Claus well, has just left the building. Really, yeah. this is called budgeting. And you can save a little Don't talk to me. I'm, not, I'm fine. You can That's save a little out of February, March, April, May, yeah, a lot of so forth. We will continue. Because I, we I don't received. want to deprive I've Christmas for any students. Well, I mean, I, 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 we need to make sure we email every employee. We will. We need to be notified ASAP. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, this is Christmas money that we're um, going to ask yeah. a quick question. Yes, how many of the How many of the people that we're working with to actually pick up their checks? Not many. Okay. Because uh, I, I know that most two. of it is going to be direct deposit, but I'm I'm thinking about those people that are not yes. necessarily on campus right. for that 31st paycheck. Right. And I thought they most of them are at right. the. Um, we don't have that many. Less than one percent, I would say. Maybe about. So we can. I mean, accommodations we need to make. Yeah. yeah. You mean everybody's I, not direct deposit no. anymore? Not yet. Yeah. Well, I was told the, I we encourage everyone to watch it. We're going to be here. She didn't get that check. I took a little out from my retail therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and I bought it to the end. Yeah. 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 And now that it would change the way. I got a ring. I can't talk from my husband. Oh, I fudged it. 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 I saw I am over here misbehaving just by the way. Um, C-13 is proposed uh, changes for 17-18, right? I, I have a question on this one. Right. I, I, I remember us having a conversation, and it might have been last year or it might have been the year before, that we wanted to have all RNs in all of our schools, and I'm wondering why we're deleting an RN and adding an LPN. Part yeah, so I want to have RNs in every one of our schools. Uh, in this case, he has been interviewing and interviewing and interviewing, and no one's uh, taking the job. So he's got an, an LPN that's ready and prepared to take the job, and we just want to get someone in their service kids. Are you required to? They got a T's and an E unit. They're required to have them. A registered nurse. Uh, I, I, don't, oh. I don't think so as well. Um, this was what? They took it out? Um, 
Yeah. I forgot her name. That's all right. Miss, uh, uh, Miss, um, is it Henderson with the health department? So, um, yeah, so she had spoken at my Rotary last Wednesday morning, and so then we were talking afterward. And then what she she said to me, she said, "How can I speak to the school board for longer than three minutes?" Because she's come and, and talked to us for three minutes. And I told her, I said, well, you probably should get with the board chair and the superintendent and set up a workshop to, you know, whatever it was. And she said, well, our, our, our concern right now is that y'all are, y'all have replaced an LPN, with, or an RM with an LPN in a place where you need, where somebody is working out of license. And she started going into talking about language that, would probably make sense to you. It was a Greek to me. And so then I said, you know what, if if you need to speak to us and time is of the essence, right. there are the ten minute speakers. And so I suggested and I sent right. Mr. Davis and Miss Bush an email and said I've suggested and so that's how our ten minute speaker got on there. And that was what she said to right. me. And, and Heather saw she does good work and um, I don't disagree with her. I would like to have an RN in every one of our schools that we can. The problem is is that it's about affordability. I don't believe that our jobs are attractive enough financially where they can go make more money in a, in, in a hospital or somewhere else. So, so right now what I don't want to do is continue to go without services for kids and uh, in order for us to continue to wait and hope that we can have someone to apply and fill the position. If you're telling me to wait and hold, I have no problem in doing that. But just know that you know, there's more days that we don't have services. Okay. Let me interject. Ms. Pineville, uh, Ms. Long said that it's not required. So I know. I, I mean, I was a guidance to... counselor there. We couldn't move without having an RN for right. those T's and E's and, units. Or, and we certainly would. And I'm surprised that they, that, I mean, we were told it was a law, so mm -hmm. I will mm -hmm. check. We'll tell them. I knew that we receive a lot of money from, is it Medicaid or Medicare? Medicaid. 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 We receive a lot and the RNs are the only ones that can sign off on that. Otherwise, is it someone from the health department that has to come in and sign off on, in, on all of that? And so we're one of the districts, we, we probably receive the most in the state of Florida, is that correct? I think we, we more than anybody, and it's because We've got RNs that are diligent about right. the paperwork and signing off on all of this. And so, you know, if we're going to another LPN, they're not allowed to sign this. So, um, but we have. Yes, go ahead. Who, go ahead. Who will do that? So, uh, to the superintendent and to the chair, of course, we desire an RN in every building. That was what we decided we would do. It's a, something that we want to offer our schools. The competition is tough, so we fill them with LPNs when we can find them. Um, I'll leave it up to the smarter people at the table to figure out how that allocation looks, but uh, our goal is always RN. We do have, at the district level, an RN that supports a lot of the care plans for our students with disabilities and also serves as a, a conduit for all of our nurses throughout the district in, in terms of training, um, first aid, those kinds of things that, that have to come up. It is the RNs that we have um, at the, the one at the district level. We would like the second at the district level to help um, to help sign off on all the care plans because to Ms. Kierkegaard's point, that's where we have to follow the rule of the law and get access to That's how it works in the hospital, too. At an LPN, most of the time, we work under an RN's license. Mm -hmm. This is the, I've heard of the staff, the proposed allocation changes. Oh, okay. Yep. This is that document. It's, it's the backup. Yeah, I just, it's that. We're trying to hire. All, all this to say is that we want, we want to hire our ends. Just, I mean, we if we're going to do something differently, then maybe we have to figure out uh, additional money to put on that individualized position to attract them. So, um, I can send a message out to some let me know. Let me know. And uh, but well, and we was it last year or the year before that we restructured the salary schedule for RN and LPNs? It might have been prior to me. Mm -hmm. Two years maybe. Yeah. So it, it's it's nicer than it had. Been. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, that was I mean, it's uh, you know, I, I wish in a in a world that can say, hey, it's temporary at the end of the year until I find an RN, but I can't do that. I just yeah. want to find someone to service kids. So. Can I just ask a question? Yes, ma'am. Oh, Terry, um, why do we require RNs to go on field trips at the elementary level with some of those INDS? I'm sorry. Why do we? Why do we? Why do we? These are, if they don't require RNs to be in IND support, why are they required to go 
with the, with the child that is classified as IFD support? It doesn't have anything to do with the label of the student. It has to do with their medically complex needs. So if we have some students that require that level of supervision, then we have the nurse accompany them. I know you know we have some students that have individual nurses because they are so medically fragile. But because we're not required to have a nurse based on a quote program per se, but rather the needs of the students in those classrooms. With that being said, we're also sensitive to if I have a youngster that has medically complex needs, then I'm going to do my best to ensure that they are supported on a site where I have that existing medical um, support those nurses. So that's why you'll see a cluster of youngsters um, with the appropriate nursing personnel at places like Middleburg High School or Ridgeview High School, Ridge Elementary, etc. So it really isn't a program issue and that may have been how it was presented in the past, but it's really more based on the individual needs of the students. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, they they think that they have to send them. No, I don't say no. You don't have to send them. <laughs> it, it, again, it depends on the needs of the students. So. Right. No, they think, <laughs> they think that know. the yeses they, they require an RN. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Obviously, they're wrong. All right, Mr. Davis, proceed. C14 is a. Uh, <laughs> has been renewed an extension for uh, two items. One is for the motor oil and transportation fluid, which would, this is a one-year extension renewal through uh, LVIs. Um, and then additional for the, cop, um, the cost per print for laser print, uh, printer countywide. And this is uh, through Sunprint. This is an extension for only six months for uh, Sunprint, but we want to go out and do a district-wide um, RFP in order to try to find a proactive way to save us money. So. Um, more work to do, but you know, that's right. Save money. C fifteen is pre qualified contractors, which is we which we bring to the board every month. C sixteen is the annual inventory of fish certification. Dr. Camp, anything you want to speak to this? That's just annual requirement that we're submitting to the state. Yep. Annual certification. For our reading pleasure. That's right. Yes. Now we get to the fun stuff. It's really just the certification. There's no big backup. Right. It's not the whole plan. Right. I had to have 16 books. <laughs> All right, D1. Um, I guess I'll just speak about this, and I'll just be brief because I know we'll discuss this on at the regular meeting. But um, I'm just, and I'll get the backup to Ms. Bush to post. But I'm just asking that if we could look at contributing something for the remainder of this year, March, April, May, June, towards the uh, help offset the premiums. And, you know, I'll submit the back of it. And that's, our, our employees are struggling. And I just think that we need to do something to try to help with the health care um, insurance premiums. And so if the board, if there's any way that we can afford to do something, and like I said, I'll get the back up to everyone. But that's just what I'm asking, is that we consider doing something for March, April, May, and June for the remainder of this year, and then, of course, <coughs> we'll do our budget. You know, that's a whole new story for next year. What do you think that the cost would be? Um, actually, <coughs> I looked at some of the stuff that we had gotten um, from Mr. Davis, an email that was forwarded from Susan in the beginning of November. And it had the breakdown of all those different models. I don't know if everybody remembers. And mm -hmm. the model three was if it was split evenly between the employer and the employee. And it would be $118 per employee based on the four months comes to, um, it would be 90000 per month. And it's a total of $360,947. So that so, would be, but that's just the, the one plan if we wanted to do less, you know, if we didn't want to do the 118 per employee per month, then we could do less. But I'm just asking that we do something to help our employees. And it would be each month? For the four months, for March, April, months. May, June. So we're talking just for the remainder of this bu this budget year. Like $360,000. Right. And that's not to every employee. Just the ones that take insurance. Just, just to offset the insurance premium for those that have it. So. And we can discuss it more at the board meeting, but yeah, I will put back up on. Legally? We can. Okay. Yeah, we can. Because I always thought that insurance and benefits was part of the negotiations. It's not bargained. Not this year. We haven't bargained anything with insurance. So um, 
we decide to offset more, we control the budget. So we have the authority to do that. The document, wasn't that part of our bargaining? Didn't we look at that in bargaining? The document that was sent to... Like you just read it, you saw that, didn't we look, document, right? that was brought to us during the bargaining session. Yeah, yeah that, that wasn't the document I was working no, on. No, it's it's a, large a spreadsheet. Yeah. It's a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember the email. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, bargaining's over, so any documents that were used or submitted to us are public record, and anybody can see them at this point. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. not like we can't reference those documents. Okay. We just never discussed insurance outside of... Which is what we need to do. So I, mean, I just it, wanted to make sure we're about well, it. It seems to me that our employees are just, they're struggling. No, and I, I, I know that. we probably all get, I mean, you're getting phone calls, we all get no, phone calls. So um, <coughs> that's what I'm going to ask on the board floor. And so I'm going to submit back up to you so that you can. It, it would require an MOU, but nothing precludes you from doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Would the MOU have to be ratified by the it membership might. in order to be effective? I'm sure we could do that in five seconds or less. <laughs> but it does nothing precludes you from doing it because of the health insurance contract is with you. And you have we have many MOUs that are done um, with the Eaton. I applaud you for even considering it because they are struggling. And they're going to be double struggling, you know, next year. Next year. Yeah. So okay. this would just carry us through this fiscal year. And then yeah. we have to review it in July. Well, and then we're on a new budget, right. so we decide okay. what we want to do with insurance at that point. And ideally, actually, on that, uh, ideally, it should be part of the contract for negotiations, and it will be. So if you could do it from now to July, but it would we'd enter contract negotiations next month anyway for the following year, and it will be put in front, the forefront of contract negotiations. I'm pretty sure of that. Yeah, meaning the medical benefits. Yes. Okay. Just making sure. How many employees right now? Thirty-one around thirty-one hundred. Out of a total of uh, forty-eight hundred. And where I, you said you're going to send us back up. And those are all planned. Right? Where, where plan would the money be? coming from? <coughs> that was that would be Mr. Davis. Can find it for us somewhere. I mean, you know, in a three hundred ninety million dollar budget, three hundred sixty thousand is, is is still a substantial amount of money, but you know. I'm, hoping you'll find it somewhere and you know we can dip into our reserve if we need to we're still way above the three percent we're what 3.97 or 4.12 3.7 when that's our negotiations you're at 3.7 so 360,000 out of that's not dropping us very much so we can consider that if we need to um, you know but I guess you know the rest of these conversations should probably be yeah. at our regular meeting okay and um, and the next item I put on that self explanatory. Okay, D3. D3, special action. Nothing at this time. <coughs> All right, D4. Um, D4 is a, is a movement, or my recommendation, I put on discussion for us to stay aligned with our legislative priorities. Um, we know that uh, there's so much we'd want to do uh, within our elementary and junior high schools in order for us to become somewhat uh, attractive and competitive. In this sense, I bring to you today is the, the, the thought of developing a Montessori school within a school model which would take place at, at Swimming Pin Creek. Um, this is an environment where uh, it would help children develop a solid foundation of creative learning. It allows students to uh, to be uh, to interact with multi-age classrooms uh, from ages three to five and six to nine. It allows us to look at uh, creative opportunities for students to fall in love with learning in a different, uh, untraditional <coughs> manner. And it allows us to learn uh, students to learn at their own pace uh, within their classroom and discover concepts in multiple facets of ways. Um, so uh, this is all about uh, you know cultivating learning and independence within classrooms and also a cohort, uh, creating cohorts of learners every single day. Um, right now the proposal is to have two, two classrooms uh, from the ages of four to six in, uh, in Swimming Pen and two classrooms from the ages of six to nine. And you may ask, Addison, why did you start with Montessori? Honestly, it's about funding. This is the one we can get off the ground the quickest. Uh, yet my heart is visual performing arts, but I believe this is a, an attractive opportunity uh, for our district and the cohort of our uh, selection of our parents. Um, the cost, majority of the costs uh, for year one will be in, in furniture and curriculi. 
which would be roughly over around over one hundred ten thousand dollars, and then you'll you'll around one hundred thousand dollars, and then uh, we have uh, funding for training, which would be around forty thousand dollars, ready to go now because we got some additional rollover money from a leadership and professional development grant that we can use now, and we can train teachers who have aspirations to um, to to lead this work. Uh, I have a short little video if we can watch it real fast, to, just to engage you into what Montessori is and what it offers. I appreciate that because I was asking questions yesterday. I have never been to a Montessori school, don't know anything about it, so I've got to do my homework. Oh, you yeah. know that. It is the last one. Is there any quick questions? You said two classes per grade level is eventually what you're aspiring to. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So it would be a school within a school. Yes, ma'am, to start initially. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Are you, are you planning to eventually expand that to? so that it encompasses the entire school is a Montessori school? We, if it continues to grow and catches on, which I believe it will, I, I believe it will, okay. and I think it will expand it as soon as things with aspirations of it. And if there's a high demand, it'll be a lottery? Yeah, yes, ma'am, yeah, they go to a point. And this is only a K-6 model. So this is where you release students to, it could be a K-8, but right now it's only K-6. And we believe that we see kids that transition across the nation, and it's been implemented for 100 years, who were mostly successful, um, you know, in their junior high school and high school years. Okay. So, Wendy Barge Park Elementary, where the parents will have to provide the transportation? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Davis, a while ago you said two classes of four to six and two classes of six to nine. Yes, ma'am. What's this? Ages six to nine and nine to twelve. Yeah, so this is just an example of a, uh, I'm just going to show you a video that talks about what Montessori is. That, um, just so you so you have a better understanding of it. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. I try to find different ways to light the fire. For some children, it may be taking something that they say and reflecting it back to them, and then saying, "How can we find out more? What do we need to do?" For other children, it may be striking their imagination by putting something in their hands and saying, "You know, we've got to find out more about this." It's me guiding what happens in the classroom and knowing when to step out of the way. A multi-age classroom is actually a beautiful thing. Elementary 1 is 6 to 9, elementary 2 is 9 to 12, and it is a community. Because there's multi-age grouping, you come into a program, you spend three years there with children within a three-year age span, and you can go at the pacing you're ready for. There's an individual plan for every child. When you master something in the Montessori curriculum, you can just move to the next level. The child doesn't move on until the child is ready to move on and has a deep understanding. The teacher's gonna individualize where each child is but you're also going to learn from each other. It's not always the older children teaching the younger. It's the student who has gained a skill that's going to help another student. Even though we do follow a curriculum, I have the luxury of watching a child, figuring out what they connect with and where they might be struggling and giving it to them as many different ways as I need to and giving them the time that they need to practice until it comes together for them. One of the cornerstones of Montessori is that we want to allow children and young adults to be as independent as they can. In a traditional environment, children are waiting to hear from the teacher where to go to get something. May they go to get something? Is this allowed? Is this not allowed? The teacher can move throughout and children can get up and there's freedom of movement. There's the ability to repeat tasks if needed and the teacher's there to support. Ultimately, we want the children to be responsible for their own learning. One of the outcomes that I have observed in Montessori children is this idea of critical thinking. They've got a problem. They throw out lots of guesses of what the answer might be. They will think through each one of those guesses and analyze it. Then they'll eventually get to an answer. They may not necessarily always get the right answer, but they know the process. And they don't see learning as a chore. They certainly see learning as, as something that is really exciting. 
Montessori education includes specialized learning materials. They are really very important to the learning process because children in the elementary age, they learn with their hands. They have to be engaged. Without telling, we allow the child to use materials to discover and unfold a truth, whether it's understanding how numbers work together, understanding the history of the universe, understanding how a culture approaches something, and they get to discover it. And then we say, wow, what do you think about that? All the education in the world doesn't matter unless a child has that sense of self and identity and has that ability to understand that kindness changes everything and that through that, they can change the world. It really develops the foundation for what Maria Montessori saw as a civilized human being moving forward through their learning, which is lifelong. When my sixth graders rock out the door, I know they're ready. They're ready intellectually, they are ready emotionally, they're ready socially to navigate the next part of their education. Side, we would still keep the mentality of, of class size amendment. Uh, we would have to work collectively to determine what, um, you know, a, a equally distributed, if there's an opportunity to have it equally distributed by each group, but then, um, you know, but ultimately we would have, if it's um, 18 from K to 3, 4 to 8, it'd be, 20, it'd be 22. So <coughs> we would protect the class size as it relates to the amendment as uh, outlined by the state. The average. You'd have two teachers in the Which classroom. is the requirement by the state. Correct. Two teachers in the classroom. You'd have one teacher and, and an assistant. assistant. An assistant. And just anticipating questions that we'll get, especially after you show the video at the board meeting. How will you, how did you select swimming pen? Swimming pen, we believe there, even though they are a, uh, uh, you know, they have increased the, the number of enrollment this year at FTE, we believe it's a, it's a good central location. Uh, we believe we have a leader that's hungry and willing to learn, and uh, we're excited by his leadership, but we think it's a good central location for the district. Is there capacity in that school right now? We have opportunity. We have, um, uh, Katie, you want to speak to what we would for, for our pre-K classrooms? Yes, we're not going to open next year with three-year-olds, but the following year we would. And bottom line, it's, it a, it's a training. It's, ex, it, it's extensive training. The, te the teachers and the principal will spend literally hours and hours with the training to get prepared for next fall. Well, I'm just concerned because that is a neighborhood school. And Orange Park South community, those children all walk to that school. I mean, there may be a bus or two, right. but that is their neighborhood school. So if we're taking classes away from the neighborhood children, right. are you looking at having to redistrict or anything? No, not at this time. I, I believe the neighborhood children will, will be excited about this opportunity and, and transition to, into this. I think you'll have more demand than you will. Um, not so. My next question is, how will you select the students for it? Yeah, initially, uh, will the selection process will be those who aspire to attend. If it get to a point where we hit capacity, then we may have to transition to a lottery for that. So, um, uh, if approved by the board, we will then engage, formally engage the community and uh, start to grow a three to four year old, or four, eventually a three to four or five year old program. And then, uh, if it, we, I do agree that we will continue to grow, and eventually may have to go to a lottery system, Not which means, but we have sufficient opportunity for, for for students to to attend. We have seats at uh, Plymouth Island. We have seats at Thunderbolt. We have seats some seats at Doctors Inlet. So my final question is kind of just academic, like because I just don't know. Yeah. Is it going to be a harder transition? for a nine-year-old than a six-year-old, or is it not because of this kind of the kind of parent that will choose this for their child? Um, I don't know if there's going to be a, a, a harder transition by age. Um, it, it may, from an individual being in a traditional setting, and, and but if their parent if their parent aspires for them to be in this setting, they, they may adapt. 
uh, but more quickly. I've seen the model uh, grow from a three-year-old, five-year-old, and a six-year-old, nine-year-old program uh, and, and be successful. And uh, But I mean, from our side of it, we will help coach parents and conference of parents to make sure this is the right environment for their children. Like I said, I, I believe we'll have an overwhelming response as soon as you launch this. Something. So if someone lives in Orange Park South, yep. which predominantly fills mm -hmm. so that's cool. and they are, you know, six years old or five years old, <coughs> and they are zoned to that school, right. if they don't want to be in Montessori, they have traditional will be classrooms. traditional classrooms for them. Yes, so it'll be a choice for those living mm -hmm. within yes, that district. I just want to make sure that the kids who are district in there aren't going to be pushed out. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause well, if it becomes a, a, a lottery system, then they are pushed out. Then they have to doctor's inlet for the, 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 the out lines then. used to be it, the, the white. The only way there's a, a push if there's continued growth in the area and that there's a um, there's a, a continued need for and then the we might have to go to a to second school. location. Yeah. That's what we would do. We yeah. would branch that out to another location so we would protect neighborhoods. So this is just the beginning and we'll see and we'll work yep. with it as it's, it. it's, a, it's just an opportunity yeah. for choice. What do we do with them in junior high when they've been in a Montessori themed learning environment and, and you know, there's no, not that there's no structure, it's right. just a different type. Mm -hmm. When they get to junior high and now it's traditional yep. and they've not been exposed or you, you know, it, what do we do then? That's what it's all about. It's about preparing them for junior high school. So it's not mm -hmm. about launching them into a Montessori junior high school program, which you can. Some are, some are K-8s, some are K-6s, but it's about preparing them how to interact with others, how to be self-disciplined, how to, how to have, understand chores, how to understand the, in, to fall in love with, with uh, curriculum and, and learning. So it's all preparation to get a kid ready mentally and physically and, and socially in junior high school and in high school. So it's not an isolated, we stop your services. It's all built upon coherently for you to be successful when you hit that junior high school year. What about testing? I, you know, still, so it's still standards we have to teach. I mean, there's curriculum that's aligned. Mm -hmm. So the teacher evaluation for those teachers would be the same as the traditional teachers? Um, we'll have to, to look and see if there's an adjustment, but as of right now, it would be, yes ma'am. Brentley's trying to get your attention, so oh, oh. Yeah, I mean, my problem is um, the teacher evaluation, which is part of your contract, that would require an MOU. Yeah. Um, because uh, indicators on the teacher evaluation isn't going to coincide with, with this. It isn't definitely not what was sent into the state of how our teachers are going to be evaluated, how 33% of their evaluation is going to be evaluated, and also the indicators uh, of the FEEPs itself. Um, I have a lot of questions about this. I mean, I, you know, Mr. Broski did give me an MOU, but the MOU last week, and I didn't sign it because it doesn't. Um, address the teacher training. I'm not sure of the data of taking traditional teachers and suddenly making them Montessori philosophy because, you know, I mean, I read Summer Hill in, you know, 1972. So, <laughs> you know, um, I went to McMaster in 1973 and saw the Montessori program in Montreal. But I'm not sure where the philosophy of taking a, a or even the administrators trained to be able to evaluate a Montessori teacher. So I have a lot of questions on the entire Montessori program as it stands contractually right. with you. Um, so and I, and the, our evaluation, unlike lots of evaluations in other counties, are part of our contract. Mm -hmm. So I would say that, um, respecting this to the board, I have no questions whether or not a teacher can move transition from tra tra traditional teaching to Montessori teaching. And uh, I know no one at this table wants me to, and, and even Ms. Ms. Piva, no one wants me to go out and, and hire Montessori certified teachers because that's not our own people. So I, as superintendent, I'm going to protect my, own, my teachers internally and I believe they can train. I have trained hundreds of Montessori teachers in my past. Uh, from traditional to Montessori, they have been highly effective. We've used the same evaluation tool in, in my former life and the same mentality of it. So um, if there's any adjustments that need to be made, it, it, we will be made through DOE and, in, and through partnership with Ms. Piva, if need be. Um, but uh, and from a leader's perspective, it, it, you know, it, you love to have someone that truly understands Montessori. But if you have someone that has a willingness and skill set to learn it and grow and do it from internally, it's exactly what I want to do as superintendent.
I think you hit the nail on the head that the willingness, the yeah. desire, Leadership. will drive the ability. Yeah. And it's, that's, that's what we see in the program with the children. I, like to your point about them being prepared for junior high school, you're encouraging independence. Right. And that's definitely going to prepare them to be successful in junior high and high school and college eventually. So, and well, ladies, we have lots to study. And you had so openly Mr. Mr. Pye, Mr. Ivey's had conversation with teachers that I mean really I think we're super excited. Ms. Muller has been leading the way and, and I'm glad that uh, Ms. Piva didn't sign the MOU because we want to make certain that the board approves before we move forward. Um, and that's intentional, but we just want to put some type of language in front so that we're on the same page as it relates to training, selection process, and we'll get to the eval. Katie, anything you'd like to say? We have teachers there at Swimming Pen that are really, really excited about an opportunity to do this. But are we required to advertise, uh, put a job description and opening out there? Because we can't just give it to the teachers. We actually, yeah. we're creating new positions, so we actually have to do a uh, we have well, there's a lot of things that have yeah. to, you know, I mean, I know with the right way. I think we do MIU and bypass that. Wait, just to this time, but you have the floor. Um, you know, I don't have any problem of writing MOUs if I have a clean idea what you all want, but I've heard so many things, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, I haven't spoken to those teachers over there, so I don't know how many of them are, are interested. Yeah. I don't know. We're supposed to advertise. I mean, yeah, we to, can. We can, yeah. we can sign an NOU if we need to for. To I don't know what the training in entails, so I'm just talking like you know, you're putting this in yeah. front of the board, but yeah. teachers well, don't. We don't know. Not to be disrespectful, my team knows exactly what we're working for. We work with Mr. Ivy. He understands, and I respect the principal and his ability to work with teachers and select teachers in order to lead this work. We have to do things differently. All the mechanics of if we need to sign MOUs to understand application process, interview process, I believe that me and Ms. Piper are very capable of making that happen. Okay. We have plenty of time to get some questions answered. Uh, I'm sure Ms. Muller will be glad to help us through. I probably have questions because I am starting from the square. Yeah, we sure are. We got it right. Okay. Uh, D5, Mr. Davis. D5, okay. So I'm going to get a PowerPoint up. I'm going to hand this to you. Mm -hmm. Are these the allocations? Yes, ma'am. So this is where we continue, you know, we continue to come this morning. This is it. Oh, no, no, no. no that's the rest. Uh, I'm no, no, expecting you a stack. No, you're going to get that. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> no, no, we have. We don't have a lot of bank employees, but this is the whole thing. Yeah, I think she makes it. She's supposed to be bringing copies. It's too yeah, small. Yeah, 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 no, 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 no. You're gonna get copies. Trust me. She's she's supposed to be bringing copies. Let me check with Toby. Is that what you're She was running. Yeah, that no, that's that's supplement. That's supplement. All right. So overview this of this. <laughs> This is not Oh the, my God, is this a three font? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, we're going to put it on the screen here. So I should not have handed this out yeah, until I get the power. This is a good trick. Hey, oh, by the way, this is not right. Really good trick. This is. Uh, yeah, you know, you, you uh, uh, per page. So in, in presentation 101, never oh hand out a handout until after your presentation. So, because uh, everyone's looking at my handout and not my presentation. And this Piva, no strategy. A little spot you can. <laughs> all right, so overall, so um, Ms. Bovine is, is working to, to make sure you have all of the information you need uh, so you can take with you. But today's about staff allocation, how schools are actually funded, and overall model recommendations. As you know, last year we adopted a staff allocation model for all of our schools in order to become fiscally responsible. Um, once again, I, and originally it was 149 positions that I brought to you last year, uh, and we worked collectively, you know, many days before the board meeting and, and, and the next in order to find a, a happy medium. And um, I will say that I was very open last year, and I said I will continue to push this model so that we are in line financially, so that we can do things such as uh, take on some insurance for our employees, which hasn't been done, I believe, in nine years. Um, we'll go to um, the, the next slide. Um, this is our staff allocation model. Uh, sorry, it's really so small. The only adjustments that we made was to the administrative uh, 11 month and 12 month, uh, how we um, how we employ uh, administrators to identify their staff allocation. What this changes is actually just put in practice for what we did last year. 
So it's not a change to add or delete. It's more of a change to make to get a better in line of what we actually offer. So, so there we go. What exactly did you do there? So yeah. So uh, so everyone, every school gets a principal. And then uh, every school gets a, an elementary. That's good. That's why state statute, you got to have a principal. And then uh, the next tier would be how you generate your assistant principal. So assistant principal is 11 month. We changed it from 0 to 749. So you'll get 11 month AP versus 0 to 850. We noticed that some of our schools were in that out of compliance with this model because we had some programmatic and school improvement ads through, through the allocation uh, through last year. So we just brought this back into better alignment where it doesn't impact our schools. And then additionally, if uh, you know, versus if you go over 750 to 900, you get a 12 month uh, AP versus a uh, 11 month AP. And then transition, if you're over 901, you get an additional allocation for assistant principals. So this is just to clean up what we, we currently have. This doesn't impact our schools in any way uh, other than, um, you know, you'll see that at the end of the day we're decreasing APs and reducing them uh, within our schools at end, after we have the, uh, the final model. So nothing here, just getting it back in line. Where are we decreasing? Uh, two mm -hmm. schools, uh, I'll, I'll get through it. Um, one school is going to be at Poe because Poe goes to mm -hmm. significantly down from 14 to 1800. Mm -hmm. The other one would be a decrease at Oak Leaf Junior High School because they go from 1500 to 1100. So those are the two that we and those are eliminated. And the new one will open up with principal and one eight. Yes, ma'am. All right. Next is uh, our junior high. You can go to the next one. Is a you can zoom back out. Sorry, you're doing a good job, Miss Bush. <laughs> Four. How many elementaries have? Two APs. Not many. Um, I would say anyone that uh, that qualified through our um, through our allocation to have I think it was over nine. Anybody ever know? Yeah, which would be Patterson, Thunderbolt, um, Oak Leaf Elementary will next will next, well, next year. year uh, uh, those are uh, three. Okay. Poe has it now, but they will they, they will, will lose it. That's and uh, the other one will probably be uh, Times. Because yeah. they're very four. close. Are the APs? They are the elementary 11 or 12 months. It's a, the majority of them are 11-month, and, this, and it's just a blend of it. Some have 12, some have 11. Could I say, be really clear about um, the number? It's, it's one or the other. So if you're a school of 0 to 749 kids, you get 11 months. Everybody gets an AP. Okay. Then if you have 750, your 11-month becomes 12, or you get a 12-month. So make sure I want to make sure y'all yeah. understand. You don't have one not, plus you get one plus another one. one. And one. Right. We're, not, We're not Ellen today. The 901 gets you the second one. Then you get a 12-month and an 11 month. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. One of the things that we will speak to, I'm sure, is that we have a, a formula that if we all understand it, we all follow it, then it's equity for everybody. And then we're not adding random positions that cost us money and we can't justify to other schools. So that's what we've done on the elementary model is to make sure it's really tight. Because I can remember in past years there being no rhyme or reason. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. well, yes, ma'am. We're trying to clean it up. Schools. Bigger schools will have some money. Bigger schools really cost to do a lot of registration. You're right. Yes, ma'am. And then high school model stays the same as well. No, no adjustments, no changes. And we'll go to the next slide. So this is where we you know we know that schools are in Clay County District schools. There's two common ways that we allocate uh, funding. One is the staff uh, staffing ratios between student and, and, and teacher, and that's uh, K3 is 18, 4-8 is 22, and 9-12 um, is 25. And we also look at weighted student funding, which is additional services that may be needed based on kids' needs or and, and based on being able for them to be successful. And then there's three areas we've always looked at, three principles that we determine whether or not we needed to add. And that's whether or not it's a school improvement ad. When I give you an example, this year we had a school improvement ad at Charles E. Bennett through the work of Ms. Paiva and, and Dr. Stallman with Behavior Interventionist. Um, that's a, a school improvement ad that really helped from a behavior standpoint, whether it's a programmatic ad where we are protecting pathways as we did last year in, in, in secondary schools. And then looking at class size as, as we continue to make certain that we chip away and always um, uh, working through that process, and which is the same formula that we've had in 17, 18 to be consistent. Okay. <laughs> Next slide is, um, yeah, we froze. Okay. Oh, go back one. Go back one, one, one. Go back. Go, or go, all, you're all, go keep going back. You're on the wrong way. Okay. Other way. Uh -huh. 
Thank you. That was pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, <laughs> yeah. Let's see the other one. Right. You <laughs> see that strategy? <laughs> 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 We don't see any problems. Yeah, I know, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, go to the next one. There we go. So, oh, oh no, back again. Back again. I, I don't know. It's not on the loop. I don't have delay. There we go. All right. One, more. one more. Yeah, one more. Next one. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Nope. That's it. That is it. All right. So school funding calculation, as you know, you like my stick figures and my team laughs at me for trying to create and draw that. One kid equals one uh, full-time equivalent student. So the base allocation for that kid is $4,200. And then once you look at the inclusive and all the resources we look at with classroom, instruction, expenses, ESC supports, operation, transportation, technology, uh, non-instructional salaries and instructional salaries and supports, it is really equivalent to being around $7,100 for, for every one of our students. So as you know, so from looking at a school perspective, if, you know, in the next wave, in Tier 2, if one of my students is equivalent to 100 students, we know that's 300 students, and we times that by $7,100, which they are inclusive, all of our inclusive FTE money, then a school gets $2.1 million, and that's all the inclusive services. So what we've done with this model is to make certain that if you have 300 students, you get $2.1 million, unless you have three additional principals. So we no longer in a part where school has 300 students, and they get three million dollars, and we have uh, you know low, really low class sizes between seven and thirteen kids in a class, which we've historically had when I arrived, honestly. And then we get to a point where we have a lot of the supports in one of our school in, in our schools, where we have one individual to three additional supports uh, within within uh, within our schools, and we don't have unprotected pathways that we're branching out, and we're which made made us un, unhealthy from a financial perspective. So. Only reason I bring this to you today is to show you is that we truly have done. You have 300 kids. This is what you generate to be fiscally healthy within our school district. The next slide is um, the next slide is a model we use for elementary. So if this if yeah, I couldn't fit K through six on this slide, so this is a K three school which we don't have. Love to have, but we don't have early literacy. Uh, early early childhood. We, what we do is take the number of teachers by each grade level, and this is kindergarten, first, second, and third, by the number of students, and then we ultimately allows us to see whether or not we are in class size. As you see, some of these uh, school, some of these classes are over in by one or by two, but it, we can't go into a point where we are hiring one teacher for being two or three uh, students over within a grade level configuration. And then at the end, if you see it in the, I think that's mauve, pink, I'm not sure, it gives you the total, we do a total number of teachers versus number of students, which is this, in, in this case, it, it's equivalent to being, um, you know, the average of being 18 per, uh, 18 per, per classroom at the K-3 level. Same way if we go to the next slide, which is in our secondary, and uh, we do an examples of, of secondary and junior high school and high school, where we take, uh, we know that teachers teach five periods, and we take a six period master schedule configuration to make sure a teacher, uh, let's see, teacher one has a planning period. And then we make sure we put 22 in each one of the, the five classes they, they teach. And then it identifies a formula of how many sections we actually need by, uh, by, um, uh, by period. And then it generates, it allows us to tell us how many teachers we actually need in order to collectively service our students in the manner that's aligned to class size. And this model, it's a junior high school model. With 22, um, uh, with 22 kids in each class, that is a perfect model. Know that in some areas it could be two, three kids over, but again, uh, but, but again, um, you know, you're not able to uh, to hire a teacher when you're over <coughs> two, three, four, five kids within that section. It's just not fiscally responsible for us to do it. Let me ask you about this tiered plan that you're, we're using because this is the first year we've used it. It was always grade level class size, you know, the average of kindergarten, the average of first. Um, is this is this in statute or is this DOE? Is. Where did this come it's from? It's in statute. And is this I mean, this, was this just passed recently? No, it's, last been, year it's, or it's so? been no, ma'am. It's been for. It's, it's been, not how we've done it. It's been in years. Yeah. I I understand. I used to watch uh, VHS and go to Blockbuster, and uh, you know, <laughs> now and I'm just giving an example. It changed, and now I now I, I won't watch a movie. I, I do it on streaming so, online. Our, and I don't think it's written in policy, but our um, 
I guess the unspoken rule was always no more than three over. So if it's 18 for K through three, we wouldn't have more than 21. But we've gotten calls from a lot of teachers that have 25, you know, 26 kids in a kindergarten class. So I'm not, I don't, I don't yeah, I, I don't see yeah, where we, we have. We uh, had that at the beginning of the school year. So maybe in the beginning, maybe at the beginning, maybe the beginning of the school year we did, and yeah. this is before where, yeah, I mean, you got to understand, the, the model's yeah. built and config, you have kids that come in all the time, and this is why on the allocation today you'll see that uh, for 17, 18, you approve some classroom assistants to come in and help where we have some classrooms that are three or four over. Um, we right now we have less than two percent of our classes of sections in, in, in Clay County that are over uh, three or four kids less than two percent that's pretty good and uh, we are in complete compliance uh, when it relates to what our class size is um, related to what the state mandates are I would love to have 13 14 and 15 kids in a classroom but this is why Clay County has been financially strapped because you've had you started to branch out with so many teachers and you've been flirting with the three um, percent it's just in a perfect world I'd love to have it we, I'd love to have it but we just physically cannot have it um, and we see that our teachers are doing and I'll present the mid-year data at the superintendent's um, review the mid-year data continues to, to tick up and our teachers are doing great work so um, there, there's no research and, and and I say that I use Clay County research I used your last four years of data to show that your small classes didn't Yield the res uh, of didn't yield the results that you expected to yield with having student student improvement increase. It didn't in four years when you had 13, 14, 15 kids a class. Did you tell me that this past year we were doing this average mm -hmm. K through three, four through That's correct. That's correct. Er everyone in the state of Florida does that. Everyone in the state of Florida does that. That's correct. What Ms. Character said about some classes have a 25 or 26. If you know the specific classes, why don't you? Yeah, and I, yeah, I, I, give, you, yeah, I, I give you an example. So yeah. Liz, I, Liz Crane. And I'm sorry to use your name if you're watching. She, you know, <laughs> she would have, you know, 20, I don't know, 18, she'd have 24 kids at the beginning of the school year. And then we. How many does she have now? Um, I don't know. Do you maybe know 20, maybe 21. No, but we maybe. have, I know we have classes that mm -hmm. have 26, 27. And those are the ones that you're putting um, uh, assistance in now because it'd be and chaos yes. to try to yes. get another teacher in there yeah. so and move these kids but, uh, but that's actually accurate so exactly. you know exactly. that's my that's my heart ache here is this formula underfunds the classrooms at the beginning of the school year and then we play catch up and then it puts the <coughs> parents in chaos because I like Miss Caracas I don't want to move from her class three weeks later you know um, so you can imagine so that's my problem with this, and we always try to stay with the class size. In fact, we have contract language to stay with the class size, not the district of choice that gives you the out. Yeah. The out is from the district of choice, and there's two conflicting the statutes. statutes. One statute says you can't go three above until after the October FTE. The other statute says you can do whatever you want, you're the district of choice. So those are the two conflicting statutes in it. but. We know it's not healthy to have huge classes. It's as simple as that. Yeah. There's tons of data for that. Let me ask you, in an elementary class, the K through three, yep. um, there's supposed to be 18. What is the trigger that gets an assistant in there? So we're trying to get to a point where we, we, we've had... What's it really said? complaining. <laughs> so we get to a point where we said between three, once that hits three and four students, then it's a, it's, a, it's a flag. We want to get to a point where we acknowledge that there's four students. Is there any way that we can either have a better opportunity with moving kids so it's evenly across the board within that grade level? But if it gets to a point where it continues to expand over four, then we start looking at whether or not we can hire, um, whether it be an assistant, whether it be an additional teacher. But the, the problem is, is that the mobility is so great, so you're never going to get to a point. I mean, you can always overload. If you overload the teaching force and the staff allocation, then you're looking at releasing teachers in the first 10 days uh, because their classes and kids don't warrant it. And you're moving teachers out, and you're moving kids again. 
So I have a strategy that I'd like to speak to as I get to the end of this about what this allocation looks like. But I agree, fair. The only thing that concerns me is what Ms. Piper just said, that it's in there, it's contractual that we yeah. Were, so yeah. It might be something to make a note yeah. about. Yeah, so state statute trumps know. contract all the time. So um, I'm going to, not to be disrespectful, I'm going to follow state statute when it comes to that part of it. Which uh, statute? I'll give it to you. Yeah, yeah, choice school choice. Yeah, you know the school choice one. First school choice district. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right, we're going next. Sign. All right, so I want you to really look at these numbers because um, I've had my team run these numbers over and over again. And if you look, we are projected to have a decline in the 18-19 school year. Um, and you may say, hey, Clay County's growing, building, and, and we're expanding. We may be, but the problem is, is having single-family homes where we have young children transition to our county. Um, you know, we, there are pockets of areas that are, that are attractive and that are happening, but right now the data shows and indicates that we have, are going to be down 388 students in our school district. And this is just looping up current kids from kindergarten to first, first to second, and graduating seniors out, and then bringing projected having a three-year three -year trend projection of kindergarten kids and pre-K kids coming into the organization. So this is alarming for me. This is why it is so important to move to choice in, in, in our traditional district managed schools and at the same time for our principals to begin, have to recruit and market for their schools. It is very important to do this. What about, um, what do you anticipate with open enrollment? Do you think we'll fill up that number? Right that now, um, and right now. No, so right now we have a total of 147 applicants. Good. Um, 36 would be not counted as FTE that we currently have. So open enrollment is really kind of right now giving an opportunity for students that are already students in Clay County to go to a different school. So it's basically shifting funds. But from what I looked through as early of this morning, the only people that are coming that would come from charter, private, or surrounding um, border counties were at 36 non-residents and that are not already attending school. Let me previous to, just, just one sec, previously to um, open enrollment um, becoming an issue, we don't, we didn't have an interlocal agreement with like Duval County. So when those students from Duval County come to us, do we get the full FTE or are we just getting that the base student allocation? Well, getting the full FTE, yeah. as long as they're here for the full two counts, right. even though they don't live in our county. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. that's good. I know, right? Well, I think they're getting the full amount. Yeah. 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 What, I, what I'm wondering, looking at these numbers, is yeah. why the uh, big drop in junior high? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I don't understand. we're losing a grade level at Oakley Junior. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to lose a grade level at Oakley Junior because it's of the new school. And, and this tells us we've got it, we've got it. So this is my point. Go ahead, sorry. But then you would. I could speak just an opinion on that. Okay. Um, I think that there's going to be a decline in our school district. Yeah. Okay. Um, first of all, we know as parents, those are some tough years with our kids, those junior high school years. Oh, really? <laughs> 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 um, and Years I, are ahead of you, darling. Yeah, I know. And um, I've talked to community members where there's a real appetite for junior high school on Clinton Island. They don't like to have to drive their somewhat young children. That's been so many probably. years. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think some of that is what we're seeing with it, just a community desire for right. something different at the junior high level. And, and sorry, and through the chair, sorry. Uh, what I'd like to do, this is why I talk about to my staff all the time, and I haven't really engaged a board about it because I want to figure, and Ms. Piva as well, I want to start bringing three and four year old programs into schools that have capacity. Mm -hmm. And the way you do that is by, and I want to own the teachers. I don't want the er, an early literacy coalition to own the teachers. I want to own the teachers and put them on our side so that we can train them and we can have them. But you get three and four year old programs, you can start having in a farm system for elementary and uh, you start building capacity. So. Um, we're looking at right now to figure out where we can potentially offer that, uh, but I think that would definitely help with us with, with moving and improving enroll, enrollment within our school district. I also think that maybe if there's a way to look at, and, and I know that what I'm about to say is kind of the impossible, okay. but you guys are all smart and um, can figure it out, but I think we all know pockets of our county where you, you always ask, will there be any capacity opened at the school? You know, Keystone Elementary is one. For decades, right. people have asked, can I get my kid into there if I don't live in the zone? And um, I know there's some others in, in Fleming Island and in Oakley. I, don't, I just wonder if there's a way to 
if we know we're facing an, uh, an issue, and I and I think I think choice is one of the ways I really do. But I think if there's also a way to um, add seats, if you will, yes, at some of these schools yes, that we know, if we added capacity, they would right. come into the county. I mean, the the Keystone area comes to mind because you would yes, pull MTE from yeah. Bradford Putnam. Yeah. So you're not pulling current Clay yeah. County kids. The yeah. Duval kids that Ms. Kerrigus talks about yeah. are some of those too. You know, if there's a way in that Argyle area to pull some of those. And I think at the junior high level, your idea about extending the Cambridge program to the junior, that's a huge, yep. that'd be a huge drawing point sure. for a lot of We're, we're working so on that right now. <clears throat> How many portables do you have, Dr. Kemp? I just said, I said, y'all are smart. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but funding we, matters. It does matter. And I, I will tell everyone on this board, Dr. Yeah. Kemp is going to engage you individually. Um, uh, I got his start. email. And it so, had a plan for and, over an hour. And, and let me tell you, I can <laughs> promise you, I, I'm going to say this at this table, I'm not going to get into it because we got other stuff to do. So we've got, we got a time frame. You're going to be blown away. I'm just telling you, so be prepared, be ready, be excited, because I'm excited. Is the auction off portables? Uh, no. We'll <laughs> uh, be coming in April with that. That's right. <laughs> All right, so this is so where when I'm... when is this big surprise? When uh, I'm just going to let he's go. I'm yeah, gonna I, can't, I don't want to speak. Can I, I don't want to... We get it. A little one-on-one -on -one time. It's going to be awesome. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, you will be blown <laughs> away <laughs> after one hour. <laughs> I'm going to stay out and let him do the deal. Mr. Yeah, Superintendent, through, through the chair, if I can, another thing on the enrollment is we have to, we have different vari variables that we look at. Uh, like, for example, the sixth grade cohorts, fifth grade cohort, the sixth grade, a very small number of fifth graders compared to last year's group coming in. So the junior high numbers were affected. It looks worse than it actually is. Right. But when you actually look at the N, the number within a cohort, mm -hmm. um, it was the same thing with kindergarten, too. So every year, a cohort comes in with different numbers of kids. Sometimes you have an overly large cohort sometimes you have those that are under average so as we do the roll-ups for projected counts that sometimes plays into the figure okay. and also we have no knowledge of uh, what might come to us privately um, or through choice at this point so we plan for that okay. looking forward to meeting with each of you okay, okay. Uh, all right so next slide <laughs> I know next. all right so this is the overall impact when I do your allocation model you look at um, you look at uh, where we are from a school district and funding wise from the elementary side and I wrote this down the same way I did last year from elementary junior high school high school alternative and that's our CDAs that's our bannermans and I did it by instructional uh, basic instructional that's a regular not non ESE ESE instructional supports counselors media media tech APs if you go across if you look at um, going down overall the you see a, a minus of the staff allocation plan of 26 instructional teachers. If you go to the, to the instructional ESC, we, we would be adding back overall nine ESC teachers, which is a total of a decrease of 16.9 teachers through the staff allocation plan. This is basically built, but the, the big bulk of this is due to the fact that junior high school, you see minus 23 is for Oak Leaf. And um, you see some variations in, in elementary. Poe just was, the reason Poe doesn't look the, the same way in elementary because Poe elementary has been dispersed to Discovery Oaks. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at supports, we uh, basic supports, non ESE supports, you see a, we will be adding 1.9 uh, uh, supports overall at the school district. Um, I'm going to come back to the ESE supports. That's a large number. I'm going to let staff speak to that in just a minute. We'll be adding 1.8 uh, guy, uh, school counselors within our school district, one media, one media tech. Those two are directly linked to um, Discovery Oaks, mm -hmm. and so is the counselor a point eight somewhere else. Uh, and then you see that we are decreasing the two APs, as mentioned before, through, uh, mm -hmm. through the chair, through Mrs. Kierkegaard's questions, where they were. They were at Oak Leaf Junior High School in Poe, which is um, uh, puts us at uh, minus 64. I want, before I go to my next slide, because I have a plan to address Ms. Piva's strategy, which is a legitimate concern, I want to talk about the ESE supports. And um, if I can have Ms. Rolfe and Mr. McCauley uh, speak to this point, so you'll have a better understanding where we are with this. Um, what we've tried to do is to really staff according to our units for this year. We have had, um, in the past, we've had some 
youngsters that if we kept uh, moved a unit from school A to school B, the teacher, of course, was moved, but the assistants weren't necessarily moved. And so we've tried to clean that up by using our formula and how we're assigning assistants. We've also redesigned how we're serving our students with emotional and behavioral difficulties in terms of reclustering those sites um, across a narrower band of schools, which we think is going to be helpful because I'll have more classrooms available to serve students and to spread out the needs of students. And when I have fewer grade bands within a classroom, I require less support in that classroom. And so we've looked at that real carefully <coughs> and aligned our allocations both for teaching and support to that. We did a lot of movement of units. Um, you know there's always movements of units with our ESE programs. And then we've also um, just tried to clean that up and to make sure that we have the staff that is necessary to support our students and our programs. Because I know you know how important that is and how strongly uh, we feel about doing a good job. And our teachers and staff do a great job in serving our kids. But we've really looked at the formula this year. I think one of the other things that's playing a part here is many of our students are going under the inclusion model. So when they, when they go to inclusion, that's a teacher allocation, not an assistant allocation. And the goal, obviously, is to get them into the, the gen ed environment um, and give, uh, is it about well, 1 to 20? Uh, around or, 20. Uh, for every 20 students that are on the inclusion model, we, we get a teacher allocation to support that. Um, at the secondary level, <coughs> we give um, support facilitators to support the work of gen ed classrooms. So there are mechanisms that we trigger uh, to keep kids in the gen ed environment, um, meaning we don't need as many of the assistants in the classrooms as Ms. Rogers. And, and that is our, our excuse me, what I understood, you said that one of the reasons we have so many assistants is it would be moved, but they would stay at the school, they, they were part of the school, and then we wound up with, so like, how, how many assistants would you have that I well, I'll use an example at okay. Shadow Lawn Elementary where over the past number of years we've had units for students with significant hearing deficits as well as uh, back in the day students that had some serious visual deficits. Well, all of those students are now mainstreamed on their home campus, um, but we never, we moved the teaching allocations, but never moved the assistant allocations. And Why not? It just didn't happen that way, it was stuttered, and so that's, I have to own that, and so we've certainly, it's not as if those assistants weren't being utilized, of course they were, but we assigned them to support our students with disabilities and more self environments. But this is just kind of cleaned up to get everything back to it, It's a combination of things, yes ma'am. I was going, going to ask about, you, you made the comment, Mr. McCauley, that we're moving more people, more of the students, into inclusion models. Who qualify? who qualify for the right. inclusion. These can okay. Numerous questions that are going through my head. Are we closing any programs right now? Last year, we went when we were going through this, we were moving, closing, dropping out a couple so, of the programs in some of our schools. Right. If, <laughs> I, if I understand the question correctly, bless you. Um, and Ms. Private and I have had those conversations for whatever reason. If, if it's related to the LI units, and mm -hmm. I'm not on camera, but we're not closing no. LI units. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> to the extent that we That's, need LI uh, units. Right. Um, so it, yeah. to be clear, uh, I think all of us appreciate that the world of, of ESC is a very fluid place because kid, we, we have goals. We want kids in gen ed, regular ed settings. Um, but we identify the disability, we determine what their needs are in the moment, and we have to provide those services. We are obligated to provide those mm -hmm. services. And and so the, the, the units come and go as a function mm -hmm. of kids being assigned to that school um, or, or to that particular classroom environment that we know would best meet their needs. Uh, obviously, Ms. Roth and her team do an awesome job with just trying to keep keep kids from having to travel an hour and a half on a bus in the morning. So it's a it's a balancing act. Um, but yeah. at the end of the day, we ultimately look at um, what their needs are, trying to get more of them into inclusion where we can support them, uh, and, and then ultimately being uh, better stewards of, of the finances that we get both from the federal and the state. Following, sorry, yeah, following sure. up that question then. Um, 
with the number of ESC support, these students go into the inclusion classroom and depending on the inclusion model that's being used by that individual school, we're finding that some of these classes are predominantly students on IEPs yeah. versus the true inclusion model right, where right. students are helping each other. And that's where when I say, okay, now we're going to take some of that support out, sometimes that yeah. support benefits, obviously, those larger ESC classes. I know they're inclusion classes, but they almost mm -hmm. appear to be a pullout in, in one respect or another. So we, through the chair, we have to do a better job of scheduling kids. We cannot have uh, classes that have students with, that are that are really overweight with students with disability. It's unfair to the learner. It's unfair to a teacher. So when we when we do a better job distributing uh, our classrooms based on uh, abilities and skill sets, we'll have a better job for a support facilitator to go in there and work with a cohort of learners versus trying to pretty much teaching the class at whole scale. So we, we are continuing to work every single day. This is actually an evaluation uh, conversation we had last year, Ms. Piva, about the weight of the class and how many kids mm -hmm. are in certain classes, but I totally agree. So um, we have to do better with scheduling, but this is ultimately from a cleanup perspective of years of um, leaving supports um, and then just from a teacher perspective and now going to a support. Know that in ESC support, we usually have between 10 to 15 individuals that have vacancies every day um, within these positions. So, uh, um, uh, and then we have a tremendous number of retirements that, that I put on this document that, that the average again that we'll have over 200 and, and you know 68 uh, retirements or resignations. That was going to be my question. Ms. Piper has asked to say something. Yeah. Um, just to clarify, you're cutting. 50.8 ESC yes, support ma positions? Is that what you're cutting? That's correct. Um, like I brought up in the meeting that we had, that we have teachers doing ESE classroom support, changing diapers, because there's no support personnel. Teachers don't change diapers. Um, how is that going to be addressed any any better when you're cutting 50 more positions of ESE support? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. I was going to say many of our classrooms, as you can appreciate, we don't have the number of assistants that are necessarily assigned to those classrooms and can't fill the positions. Um, we do what we can to find personnel who are interested in the work and interested in the rate of pay mm -hmm. and put them in there. So, specific to Ms. Piva's concern, there may be classrooms where we have allocated an appropriate number of assistants and, and an appropriate based on our model and we just are having trouble filling them. Mm -hmm. The assistants that we are, are recommending that we cut, again, as a way to just calibrate kind of our classrooms, our models, um, the way the direction we're moving. Um, to Ms. Piva's point, it's not necessarily that we would cut that assistant, for example, we just have to find someone to fill that position. When, um, through the chair, Mr. Davis, these these classrooms that are operating with a Kelly assistant who can't touch a child, so can't do the duties of a classroom assistant, have we ever even contemplated doing, um, if we're over that many, if we're over that many, if we can cut 50, 50 support people, um, have we ever thought of doing an involuntary transfer or ask for, have we ever yeah, thought so of doing anything instead of these teachers being put in a situation of yep, liability? Yep, yep. They're outside their classroom, so yep. the day they get sued, I hope yep. you all jump in there and say, good job changing yep. that diaper. So at the end of the day, I agree. We can do something. We can look and we'll, we'll look and work with Ms. Dixon and, um, and I know that's one situation that we have to look into and, and assist from an administrative standpoint. But I'm all favor of involuntary transfers, not only for teachers, but also support staff as well. Because it just sounds like you have at the different places. So, no, I agree. Okay, Ms. Condon. Uh, so, Mr. McCauley made a, a um, statement that we will use support facilitation at the secondary level for those students. Um, and so my question is, I know Alachua County uses this, the support facilitator for the 
those ESE students, and they actually use it, I think they call it learning strategies, but they actually give the student a credit for it. So the teacher can either pull out or push in whatever the student needs, extra help, whatever, but they actually can get an elective credit. Have we considered doing that so that the student feels successful? Yeah, we actually do that. Oh, yeah, do we? We have some of our we students okay. based on That's Where we that. struggle with that one, uh, Mr. Superintendent, to the chair, is the, um, um, the curriculum that we use for learning strategies is based on the University of Kansas. It's, it's a very good strategy. It is working with our kids that are in it, um, but it's intensive. Right. And the training piece is intensive. Uh, so we we struggle with um, some of our, our secondary buildings keeping teachers in, in that, that position, position so that we can continuously offer it. So I might argue at risk of being on camera that I'm telling something I know about a lot of that they call it learning strategies. That's what the student gets the credit for, but they may be helping in different. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. Their I gotcha. Math class I gotcha. I, no, I gotcha. Call anybody out. Exactly. I agree. I mean, I it's, a, it's an elective class, so yes, you know, it's not as set curriculum by the state. Let me ask you this I remember several years ago, I remember when we got the, doc, the autistic class being moved to so are just take autistic for an example. How many of these quote letters, you've got letters for you. I do have lots of letters. Yes, how many of those will be moved from the school they're at to another location? Because you know that's when I call you and the parents are like. We are, um, and I can give you a specific number. Okay. I, I don't know that off the top of my head. What we have tried to do is ensure that as we have um, made any movements of classroom units, it has been to give us more options to serve students so that I don't have a single class in isolation, but rather it's part of a cluster of, say, two or three classrooms to serve those specific disabilities. And that, that does help us so that if the student has a particular need, I can meet that need perhaps to help with teacher A, but also but perhaps teacher B or C he has those abilities. Okay. So. I'm just concerned about how many parents will go and say, oh, well, you know, although you've been happy here for two years, we're going to do it. <laughs> and that's when we start getting home. So, it's long distance. So, yeah. So, right. Yeah, we have to do it like that. I just, okay. Not to my knowledge. So okay. one thing we want to do, we have 15 EBD units, and one thing we want to do is consolidate some of our units so we're not so spread thin with services and resources. We have a lot of people that spend a lot of time in cars going from school to school. So we want to take the 15 EBD units and down to 11 so we can do a mainstream work and then school. flip these school. yes, yes, right. schools. Down to 11 schools, thank you. <laughs> to 11 so we can have greater resources uh, for, for time on task at certain locations. That, okay. that is something we can Well, get. you have given us plenty to we'll study nice over to see what's where. There as far as transportation yeah, issues. Yeah, That is what we dealt yes, with. Yes, ma'am. We've we got too many people yeah. talking at one time. Okay. I've got one more slide. All right. I know, I want to get, this I got to get through this. I got to get through this. I'll wait, I'll wait. All right, go ahead. All right. Sorry, Ms. Pyle, I'm coming. Oh, I'm trying to get through my PowerPoint. <laughs> Overall recommendation. So the staff model, so my recommendation would be to reduce instructional personnel by 16.9 uh, by staff allocation. Reduce the non-instructional personnel by 50.8, and the bulk of that would be uh, the ESC consolidation of years of not addressing. And then add school counselor 1.8, add a media tech, add a media specialist, and reduce school administration by two. But then in the red, so to address the point of us waiting till beginning of October to find a teacher, I'd like to ask the board to, to uh, accept my recommendation of cutting the 16.8, but then give me 17 allocations ready to go at any point in time. So if a school has uh, starts day one with classes that are X, Y, and Z big, I can go to that allocation and make it happen immediately. Mm -hmm. We will have over 250 uh, instructional staff that will, as I said, 244 that will um, leave the profession due to retirement, non-reappointments, resignations. It's just uh, the yearly trend that I used last year is the same. I only adjusted by 10 because we only have 10 less retirements. So the 16.9 that we will, the staff allocation eliminates, they will be picked up through attrition, but then we will have the bank of 17 uh, positions ready to go to fill where my staff, where 
uh, Mr. Connor, uh, Miss Dr. Stallman, and, and Miss Piva here of stuff that we're looking at analytics to be able to throw immediately, whether it's in the summer, whether it's um, whether it's uh, day one, day two, so we're not having to wait after the 10-day count and figure out who needs a kid and put them in a different situation. So ultimately, it's kind of a wash um, when looking at that perspective. I think I'm done. Miss Piva, sorry. Um, why do you have the total instructional cut at 26 up on the top left, the last slide you just had? Yeah, that's basic. And then you say total teachers is 16.9. Because you have to add instructional ESE. So we're adding, we're eliminating basic 26 basic, basic positions, but then we're adding uh, 9.1 ESE positions. I got you. Um, could you tell me where these units are moving to? These self-contained units are moving. Right. What units are moving? It and would where be nice if we from? could give you a pure one-to-one -one movement, yeah. but that's so, not how it works. Um, primarily, we are moving the units from Lakeside, Lakeside Elementary. Um, Which or, units are there? And when we do this, when we just get a list and uh, send to me, I'll forward it to the board as well, and I'll give it to Ms. Piva. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, Mr. McCall, you mentioned something before about EBD units as well. The, the, one of the key things that just popped into my head when you said that is looking at the number of teachers or the number of students that are going to be in each of those EBD units. <laughs> I mean, is that, that's obviously being taken into consideration. It's and always. It's yeah. term, it, oh, absolutely. And most of our, our very sites. Very familiar with EBD. <laughs> yeah, most of our sites where we're <laughs> clustering them, as the superintendent described, is um, uh, we are, are looking at having a full-time site coach. Whereas right now, to the superintendent's mm -hmm. point, there's you know, a lot of back and forth. You get two schools, three schools, whatever. Um, by doing this, it allows us to put those services on site full time and not wait for somebody to get there. Okay. okay. And one other question yeah, is that you can leave to the chair to Is that right? Yes, finally. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're looking at, first of all, having 17 allocations waiting in the wings in August, which is what you're referring to, September. Yes, ready to go. Yeah. I mean, something like that, if we can do some print to that effect, so that we don't end up with 26 students so, in the kindergarten yeah. so class. Yeah, so I can address Liz Cream with so it. I'm just giving her an example with it in day two. <laughs> Poor yeah. Liz Cream. She, she, well, she, 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 she understands. She understands, and then that's, I mean, yeah. every teacher understands. And I keep going back to the inclusion classes, but having lived through the average class size, and knowing that fifth grade classes were bumping into 24 and 25 and 26, as well as the inclusion classes being 25. Um, that really, we need to really address that and keep an eye on the numbers within those classes because that's just, that's, it, it, it defeats the whole purpose of inclusion. And it doesn't help those students achieve. One of the things that we have um, been doing is inviting the Florida Inclusion Network, and they've been working with our schools, um, selective schools, certainly not everyone all at once, to assist with that scheduling process so that we do, in fact, uh, represent our students with disabilities in more naturally occurring proportions rather than having this this large cluster of mm -hmm. youngsters, as you refer to, Ms. Bola, mm -hmm. that are students with disabilities in that class. So. That is a conversation. We're going to be doing some training this summer, offering for our teachers on services for students. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we'll avoid those types of situations. Hopefully, yes. Last but not least, yes, ma'am. We see, and I, we see allocations coming out from the schools. We see the ESC support coming down. Are you looking at your office as well, and the county office as to where we can? Cut back. Where yeah. there any? Yeah. Are there any ways that we can look at positions that? Yeah. So I was. I said this before um, last year at this time. I think this district staff is understaffed, um, and I, you know, I think that uh, at, at this point, uh, don't forecast uh, any cuts um, within the, the district budget. Um, I think that uh, we could always use more. So and we just, we just. I mean, we have around 211 
compared to the remainder of of uh, the, the entire organization. There's a lot of work to be done. So, as we are looking at our population decreasing, we need to be aware of that. Right. And if we're going to come out to the teachers and yes, to the staff yeah. and say we're going to be cutting positions, yeah. we need to look at home as well. Right. Yeah, trust me, if, if if I could cut fat, which I did, I think a couple positions last year, I would. I just don't see it in the forecast for our, for our body work. Mr. Superintendent, yes, sir. I just want to make a comment regarding um, a year ago, I had come, I had spoke to a board meeting about balance. And as the noise of allocation starts coming out, I want to remind that we have to have balance in order to take, take care of some of the things we talked about today. We, I just happened to write them down as you mentioned them. We talked about SROs, we talked about fencing. We talked about, uh, in, in previous meetings, we talked about cameras and controlled access and safety and security needs. We talked about RNs today. We talked about um, insurance contributions and the ability of organizations to support the overall balance. We talked about salaries to be able to remain um, relevant and competitive so we can recruit, attract, and retain the right people for our organization. And th these are some of the things we just talked about today. I want to remind um, the individuals in this room that years and years and years ago when the decision was made to, con to continue to make decisions to overfund certain areas or over allocate in certain areas, there is an unintended consequence for that. As leaders, we all know every decision has an unintended consequence. The unintended consequence was support was cut to one, positions were cut already. Positions were cut to nothing. I have one one guy chasing one one bug guy. Well, I have one project manager. I have one one safety security person for the district. The, I just want to make sure that I publicly state because I sit here quietly most of the time. But I want to publicly state that that it's important to follow the funding formula. We must follow the FEFP funding formula, which allows this board to do its responsibility and the superintendent to do the responsibility of making sure that our organization is strong enough to be balanced for all three legs of the stool, operations, instruction, support. It, it, it helps us be healthier, it helps us stay within what we're supposed to do, and it helps us accomplish the objectives of the board. I had here every month, in my first year, maybe this is my first year statement of a school statement, school address, but I'm telling you, <laughs> I hear, find it, find it. We need to do something about it, and all of that is true. But it starts with the very foundation of following the FEFP formula and staying with what we earn. Everybody in Clay County understands that we get X amount of dollars. We have to stay within what we earn. And granted, we've got some great people, Mr. Davis, in this system. I've met some great people. You know, and we have different agencies that, that represent their units. That they're going, that's all they're concerned about is their units. Our decisions have to be what's in the best interest of the organization as a whole to put us in a better position to take care of all family, contributions, all these things we've talked about today. I, I'm, I'm concerned about the ability of, uh, of us to be able to maintain the level of support that is expected from us under the current funding formula. And if I didn't say that, I would, be, I, would, I would just be dishonest. We can go along and continue to do what we've always done, or we can slowly start to address. It was 149 positions is what we were, we were over what we earned last year. We made some changes last year. We're making smaller steps mm -hmm. this year. But I commend you, Mr. Superintendent, for doing and, and the board for at least starting to address the issue to bring this back into balance so we can better take care of all the employees in the organization. I have people, I have not had a, they have not had a raise since 2008, a cost of living. I'm losing great talent to other districts, I'm losing great talent to other districts that can go four hours down the road, make $40,000 more a year, and not be the director. So we have got to address all these issues together collectively. That's that's my comment of the day. So I appreciate I appreciate understanding that as the noise of allocation starts to come up. I want to support you. Wow. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk like that. That's a D6. Last one. So the D6 is proposal for a third party uh, administrator. I had, I had to learn what TPA was. Um, I said openly that uh, insurance is the area where I need to continue to grow. But it, in the process when insurance has come out and we're trying to find proactive ways to help and assist, I, I asked Ms. Sheila Gann and Dr. Lagucco to figure out, you know, what, where can we save money? And we started talking about uh, third party uh, administrators and other things. and. Uh, 
and we found out that um, our, our TPA was was making a lot of money uh, on us firm, um, and you know uh, through the insurance process, uh, which was over five hundred thousand dollars. So I asked Miss uh, Miss Gann, would she please look into figuring out if this is an opportunity for us to to move in a different direction? And um, she she went to uh, to a part where we went to legal weeks ago. Legal said that we could have direct negotiation, which was uh, you know was a recommendation, and, and said that we can move in that direction. So Miss Gann moved in the direction of having the direct negotiation with a number of uh, cons uh, opportunities with the organizations and consultants. And at the end of the day, um, they Mrs. Mrs. Gann, along with Dr. Lagucco uh, and I believe um, Mr. Dagenham, met with me and brought a recommendation for the Bailey Group. Um, of this, I think they had four or five submissions for from outside parties. Uh, two in which asked to meet with me, and I met with those. Um, and I say met, I started the conversation. I walked up and I got out. I didn't live the conversation, other than I stayed the entire meeting for the Roberts presentation. Um, the other group that I met with uh, was um, someone. Rar, sorry, the other group I met with was the Bailey Group because uh, they reached out to me and wanted to meet. Uh, I initiated the conversation for about five minutes and for about a couple minutes and dropped down and allowed Mrs. Gann along with Dr. Leducco to work and determine not the overall services. Um, from my side, my recommendation today is us to, um, to cease our work with Aon and uh, there's a 90-day clause and write them a letter from a district perspective and then engage into movement with uh, the Bailey Group. Um, Ms. Gann, you want to talk about the process? What were the three companies? Bailey, Roberts, and Summerlin. Roberts, sorry. Summerlin Roberts was one. Owen. Owen and Associates. Owen Associates. Gallagher. And Bailey. Yeah. Right. Go ahead, Ms. Gann. Two. 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 We met with Summerlin Roberts back before the holidays. They presented um, a wrap product that they wanted us to try to sell to our employees. It was based off of um, a really high deductible plan, um, around a $6,000 deductible you'd have to meet first. And then they wanted the district to pay for this wrap product that would help offset some of those costs. I brought to their attention that we had a hard time selling the HSA plan. We've worked really hard to increase the enrollment in that. And they wanted to um, present us with more information if the time ever arose. Well, after that, Mr. Davis and I had met, and he wanted me to give him some options on the medical insurance because he knows I've been harping about how bad our large claims are, what kind of renewal. So I asked him for some time to do that because I was in the middle of um, getting the 1095s ready in a state report. So I contacted him in January, told him I was ready to give him my recommendations, and we met. It was him. Um, Ms. Moeller, Dr. Lugutko, and a gentleman named David Ford. I presented all the options, and I had a lot of them that I could find. I mean, insurance is pretty cut and dry. There's not a whole lot, but I gave him everything I had. And during that meeting, it was brought up about what some of the other consultants were earning in their fees. So um, I had also received an agreement or an amendment to our original agreement with Aon that they wanted to submit for a signature and to extend our contract through 2019. I have mentioned on several occasions to Dr. Lugutko that I had not been happy with the services that I've been receiving from the new group of people. I'd had an old group that I dealt with for years truly trusted them, everything they said. Mm -hmm. This group, I'm not saying they're not knowledgeable, but they're not as knowledgeable as I would like to see them. Um, they're not as creative as I would like to see them. With three people, I don't have a lot of time to spend researching a lot of stuff in my office, because I do have 5,000 actives and 1,100 retirees that we deal with every day. So um, during our meeting, when I spoke to Mr. We, Mr. Ford had brought this up, it got me to thinking, really, what does Aon make? The only thing I ever get from them, because we are um, a public entity, so we're not subject to ERISA or to file form 5500, so you never have dollars with the percent. And this has been in place since 2003. Um, that was before me. 
So I went and I put the numbers because I don't have that information or I didn't at the time from the carriers. So I based it off of what I actually pay the carriers every month. And I did my math and I come to well over 500000 And I'll be honest, I was in shock because I know I'm not receiving that type of services for that. They do do a lot and I'm not going to take mm -hmm. away from them because they are a good company. So then we met again. And I met with Dr. Lukko, and I told her, I said, I really think that we need to look at other options. And she's like, well, let's meet with Mr. Davis and get his approval before we move forward. So we did, and he was all over it. He was like, go for it, do whatever you need to do. So I did. I reached out to a company that I know the people in it very well, which was Gallagher. And I talked to Eric Scott. He's an area president. And I asked him, I said, if you could, if you could give me pricing, what do you think is a fair price? Because, you know, it's like buying a part. If you don't research it, you don't know mm -hmm. what's the best price. Right. So he gave me one. So we met again with Mr. Davis, Mr. Daggett, and Dr. Lagotko, and I told them that Gallagher said they felt like they could do the same scope of services for around $250,000. And then um, Mr. Daggett asked, he's like, so how do you really know that that is your best price? I said, I don't. All I know is it's half of what we're paying now. Mm -hmm. So of course, with my mind, I thought about it all night, and I called Dr. Lugutko the next morning, and I asked her, so do you have any objections if I send an informal email to several of the other local consultants that's been trying to get our business for years, and let's really see if we are getting a best price? She's like, sure, I think that's a great idea. So I sent the same email to three, which was Summerlin Roberts, to Gallagher, and to Owen and Associates. I did not have an email address for anybody at Bailey Group, so I called and left a message for Allison Proffitt. She's one of the senior account managers there that Alachua County had spoke about, so I left her a message the same day, right around the same time I sent the email. Well, I gave them till Friday, get me back some pricing, because I Time is of the essence, because I know I was fixing to get delivered a really high renewal. Now, this wasn't a bid. This was just a It's just an informal email from yeah. me. Can we do that, though? We didn't have to go out on an RFP? Not, not when you're shopping around. I was shopping the market to see. You don't have to do an RFP unless you're formally asking for a whole list of information and you're going out. All I did was give them our current scope of services so they'll know what to give me pricing. Because it's not something you can get over the phone. We got like four pages of scopes of services that we're asking for. So I sent the email, and I, they all knew that it was informal, <coughs> that I was just trying to get pricing to see if it was worth making a change. So when I got back all of the, um, the information, I realized on Friday that I hadn't heard from Allison Profit. And that was late Friday afternoon, because it had been a really tough week. So I put on my schedule to call Bailey Group and get an email and make sure they had the same opportunity as the other three did. Well, in the meantime, I check, normally try to check my emails on Sunday evening, and I seen an email from Mr. Davis requesting if I could attend a meeting on that Monday morning around 10 o'clock with the Bailey Group, and I thought, great, I can get their information from them, and then we can proceed. So um, we come to the meeting, spoke with them. I agreed to send them the same information that I'd sent to the other three. I gave them 24 hours to turn it around to me. They did. I tabulated everything. I read every one of them. And then we scheduled another meeting. But before I had my meeting with Mr. Davis, Bertie Stacy and myself met with Mr. Daggett to make sure exactly what could we do going forward. Because at this time, it was still just all it was nothing formal. It was a very informal request for pricing. Have you met with any of the other groups? I know Gallagher. But, and but in in that time frame when you met with the Valley Group, then you, did you skip? I went in associates this year, earlier this year to speak with me. I normally get visits from multiple people, and normally it's seven associates. But no meetings since you sent the informal email out. No, That's and my question. I, I'm, I'm the only person that we had an informal meeting with after that quote was sent was the Bailey group and that was because 
Mr. Davis set it up, but I couldn't reach them, and I had already tried to reach Allison Proctor. And you were called and asked. Right, and, and, and honestly, I don't, I've never, I don't know who the Bailey Group is. I didn't know who they were, who, who they exist. I don't know who Gallagher is. I, I'm not, I'm just told you, insurance is not my forte, but my job is to solve, to solve a nine-year problem. So for us to move forward with it, the recommendation came directly from Dr. Legucco and um, Mrs. Gann. At any point in time, Mrs. Gann, did I ever direct you who to use or who I suggest? No. The Bailey Group reached out to you and not yep. to Yep, absolutely to me. Yeah. So then I, I have no idea. I guess I see a need of insurance. Everybody keeps talking about insurance in this community. So, One of the um, vice presidents called in and so, for a meeting. And, and from my side, we had a conversation. We came, right. the meeting was at the table. I, within 10 minutes, I bowed out so they can talk about strategy. I, I met Mr. Bailey, who is the president and the owner of the organization. Um, in that meeting was, uh, I guess, I believe his chief of staff. Um, in that meeting was a wellness uh, lady who, with the wellness center who was I thoroughly impressed with about the service they can provide. And then also Travis Cummins. Openly and honestly, didn't know anybody. I, I, didn't, I thought Mr. Cummins was not even part of the Bailey Group. I thought he owned a personal insurance group and he was coming in support of the Bailey Group. So, at the uh, regardless of his involvement or not his involvement, I will tell you this: Mark Bailey is, works with Nassau County, Baker County, St. Johns County, and Alachua County. So they're doing some things right. So I was impressed with their initial conversations. And um, which one I, of them called you to set up the meeting? Mr. Cummins called me. We talk about insurance. We talk about other stuff in reference to the community and the other stuff. So. But at the end of the day, I believe, I, should, I trust the recommendation from, from uh, my staff. My staff, is, Ms. Ms. Gann, is awesome in her work. And um, we have to do a thing that's going to help save the district money and employees money. So, and then I reached out to, to two of the four um, superintendents who are happy with their involvement and what they do. So. Okay, so let me ask a question. You said you and Bertie went to Mr. Dagada and... As I understood when I, I called and asked you about all this yesterday, um, and you were told that uh, this is a legal procedure and to proceed on. Bertie what? had took um, what she found in Florida statute, and she found in DOE, because they don't just go by Florida statute, there's also DOE ruling that overrides some Florida statutes. She brought it to Mr. Daggett and asked, if we could do direct negotiation and she showed him the information that was in the DOE and he read it and he said yes. He said everything you're doing is legal. Is it the cleanest way? No. And he asked me why weren't we doing an RFP. I explained to him that I'm looking at a 30% increase which is over six million dollars in insurance that if we're going to do anything, we need to hurry this along because I have to get annual enrollment during the summer. Yeah. And if we're going to change, you've got to have a new carrier to have time, a new consultant, to look at all this and help us fight for a lower increase. Our fee so, could taking six months, right? Not yeah. Just, I mean, you're looking at a good six to eight yeah, months eight when months you're doing an RFP. Six is pushing it. So and right now, I can tell you, between the conversion of the new system and our mm -hmm. workload, there was no way I have set time to do all that. So we were trying to look at the most convenient. And I tell all of you, my ultimate goal is not to pick one group over another. It is to help Clay County School to give better insurance to our people. And if I think that we need a fresh set of eyes, we've been with Bailey Group for 15 years. Aeon. 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 I mean, Aeon. Aeon. Sorry. We've been with Aeon for 15 years. And Gallagher is another national company. So should we look at another group? Absolutely. Do I think that the Bailey Group will do a good one? There's a lot of reasons I thought that. Number one, they offered more in the scope of services. They're offering up to help um, for, format a, home, a teacher depot, and they will help get funding up to $20,000 for that. They've got more local school districts than any of the rest. They have got the same vision that our superintendent has, which is one day maybe going self-insured, and if we ever want to drive it, they have a lot of experience in it. I mean, there's multiple things that I believe, plus it's a local group. In the past, I don't know if y'all remember this, a few years ago, we had direction to do an RFP for a consultant. Nancy Racine and myself worked on that for a very long time to release it. We did, 
It went out, it came back, and before anything was open, the superintendent at that time squashed it. He didn't want to do, he didn't want to open the bids, he didn't want to look at them, so we never know what was in there. Why? Mm -hmm. I have no idea. All I know is I he mean, did not want to I open the bids. So I know that we need to make a change. There, you need a different perspective. We've been with a national company. At that time, I don't think Bailey Group could do what they can do now. They've added a lot of services that they did not have. Do I feel very confident? Yes. But we also would build in the agreement that you have a 60-day out clause. Mm -hmm. So if you have any doubts about them, give them a year. If you have a doubt, we, that gives us time to do it all. But you have choices. Your choices is either you can stick with the road that we've been told that we can do, you piggyback off of another district, and you go that route, or you sign your agreement with Aon, and I'll be glad to deliver you the renewal in June of whatever we can get by that point. I mean, we have to make a decision. We don't have a lot of time to make that decision because I've got a lot of work to do. I've already asked United Healthcare to give us the best and final by May 1st, and that's cutting it close for me because I have to have final information by the end of May in order to meet print deadlines and mailing for retiree guides that go out the second week of July and annual enrollment that I've already tried to start scheduling. So I can tell everyone in here with a clear mind, I have not had anybody tell me anything. Mr. Davis, when we met, he asked me, what is your recommendation? What's your opinion? I gave it to him and I still stick by it today, and I don't know anybody other than the people I've met. Okay. Now, uh, referring to the nasty email. Yeah. yeah. The email. Yeah, so Tim, Tim Owens. Yeah, yeah so Tim Owens sent. Yent. So Mr. Owens sends an email. I've had a conversation with Mr. Owens and let him know we appreciate it. Um, this is uh, not to be disrespectful. This is live, but people are watching. This is what... This is uh, this, the characteristics that we would expect, I would say. So um, uh, I was very upfront and told him that uh, we are in a part, we're moving in a different direction. We appreciate his opportunity and, um, and best of luck. Okay. And so after we had some pushback, what did you do then? Did you go visit the, the uh, attorney? We asked again that we were doing the right thing. He said, yes, you are still legal. He said, and again, like I said, it's not the cleanest way, but you're still legal to do the direct negotiations. So we moved forward with the agreement. When I got the first email, me and Mr. Davis did, it was on a Friday night after I'd notified the three that we were going to negotiate with a different consultant. Um, I was asked to call Mr. Owens back. I explained everything to him. And for the record, I never once told him that we were looking to do a bid. So what he told you is not true, um, that I was only looking to get pricing, and now that we've got the pricing and know the services, that we were going in a different direction that was going to negotiate. I said, that don't mean it's an end-all, because you know how agreements go, things can fall apart. I said, but that's the direction we're going. At the end of his conversations, his words to me was, Ms. Gann, if your firm ever needs anything, you know we stand ready to serve. I said, yes, sir. So I updated right after that, Dr. Lugutko and Mr. Davis of my conversation with him. And it was not 20 minutes later that we got the email that all of y'all received. So, you know, to me, that's very um, condescending of what the conversation I had with him over what he said. Did you speak again with the attorney? Pardon me? Did you speak again with our attorney? Did we speak again? Yeah, Friday afternoon. Dr. Lugut Co. and I met with uh, Mr. Daggett, and he again told us that that is, you know, the legal way that we can do it, but we can clean it up. We could do a piggyback off of the contract. That was a cleaner way, or to delay and do an RFP. So that's your decision. If you want to delay and do an RFP, I'm fine with that. We try to do a piggyback. This has to be y'all's decision. All I've done is try to bring you the information that I was asked to deliver. May I ask a question? Yes. Um, so, um, I, I think I heard, overheard um, you two, you, Ms. Pericus and Mr. Davis talking about it being a three-year contract. <coughs> yes, ma'am. While they're speaking. So, my question is, 
We have a one year term. One year cancel. Like you can cancel with like 60 days. You, right? you can cancel 60 days any time other than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my question is maybe not a question. I don't really know. But um, my question is because I. I haven't been involved in this at all, except I will, in the spirit of transparency, I had told Mr. Dy or Mr. Davis back in the fall, maybe September or something, mm -hmm. that from my time on the insurance committee, I thought there was an opportunity here, and that's but then that was the last conversation we had, and I, I didn't have that. any additional information. I appreciate the heads up. Um, but, but aside from that, I hadn't really been involved except reading my emails. But um, and then I did put a call to Mr. Daggett, and we played phone, phone tag, which is fine. My question really isn't as much about this specifically as to why would we want to sign a three-year contract if, so from what I'm hearing you say, and this is not a criticism of scam, please don't take it that way, if we asked for this, so we asked for a scope of services to be priced, mm -hmm. and you got that scope, I guess my question is thinking about we want to be creative. You talked about how the previous Aon team that we had was very creative, and I would agree with you. When I sat on the committee the first time, I thought they were. So why would we want to box ourselves in for three years, even that we have this out, if we haven't done the formal RFP process to allow all these groups to come in and present to us, maybe they could be more creative. So I, I'm just kind of thinking, like, what if in, in, when you talk about the commissions, I understand they get the commissions from the premiums that are paid to the carriers. But what if there were a situation, and I don't know that this could exist, but I'm thinking out loud. What if there were a situation where a, a, a commission structure might be a little bit higher with one group, but they might offer services that makes the overall package a better package for our employees? And I guess I feel like if we just did a this, you know, if we if we ask for this scope, do we know what all of this could be that we want to box ourselves in for three years? It's just a question. Yeah. And y'all can answer me at the board meeting or yeah. you can send an email or whatever. It's just a consideration for the length of time. So, um, to be very clear, uh, and, and, you know, going forward, Whenever a, uh, uh, an agency board attorney is asked, uh, can we do something short of uh, competitive bids? There are going to be answers, yes, but uh, a cautious agency attorney will say, well, why don't you competitively bid? Because that's the safest thing you can do. I understand that there are business urgencies at play here. It seems as though there's business urgency. So, uh, to be clear for the record, um, you've got this thing called the Competitive um, Negotiations Act, uh, Consultant Negotiations Act, the CCNA. You'll find it in Chapter 280. Uh, that's a general law. Then you go to your specific law, uh, your uh, Chapter 1000 is your education code. And you all know specific trumps general. The Under the education code, um, Really, it's put most simply in State Board uh, uh, of Education Rule uh, 6A 1.012, subsection 15. And I'll just read it very short. Except as otherwise required by statute, a district school board, when purchasing insurance, entering into risk management programs, or entering into third party administrators, uh, agreements with third party administrators, you may make the acquisition through competitive bidding or direct contract. Okay, So there's your law. That's why when I'm asked, is it lawful to directly contract, the answer is yes. Okay. You'll look around at other school districts. Some of them were noted, Alachua, Baker, Nassau. Look around you and you'll see that various of these third-party administrator contracts, in fact, have been bid. Okay? That tells me that they had a school board attorney who was forceful. <laughs> okay? Be as safe as you can when in doubt competitively bid. So that's what I'm going to tell you every time. Here, the, the law says what it says. You can also directly contract. So, I think that if we were challenged uh, that, hey, you violated the law, you had to put this out to a competitive bid, I think we'd win. 
I, I, I'm very confident that we would likely prevail if challenged. But uh, you prevail at, at what cost? You spend money in litigation, there's burden, all sorts of things, uh, ugly stuff comes with, with uh, litigation. And if you are uh, found to be wrong, sometimes trial court judges are wrong, that's why there's appellate courts. Okay? If you're found to be wrong, the risk is pretty significant. There's a, a, a attorney's fees, appellate fees, costs, interest. You may have to commit a contract to the challenging party, so on and so forth. It's kind of ugly. So you can competitively bid. That will always be my uh, preference. You can piggyback, which basically expedites your bid. Um, or you can direct contract. My questions have all, have been, and I thank you for tolerating them, Dr. Su, uh, uh, Dr. Legutko for tolerating them. I put questions to these folks because I've been trying to figure out what's the process. Has it been fair and equitable? Okay. The the rule of thumb when you're direct contracting is that you can't be arbitrary and capricious. You've got to be objective. You've got to set forth criteria that are objective and tell everyone out there when you're shopping the market, here's my specifications, here's what I'm looking for, and I'll give you equal face time. You know, I'm setting up meetings, I'm going to meet with people for 20 minutes, the weeks of X and Y. Okay, that, that's generally what your direct uh, contract process ought to look like. If, that, if there are questions about, you know, was it an even playing field with all of these, I think I heard five different Okay, four four different entities. You, if there are if there are questions uh, that it wasn't exactly the same for each one of them, uh, you can't say that with a straight face. I I, I would caution uh, not to proceed until you've given that um, standard same face time, same opportunities uh, to all of these folks. I don't know. Maybe you you were all satisfied with that, and that's fine. But, but that's, that's kind of where we're at here. I can understand the urgency, and this is why um, uh, I've told the superintendent, you know, my answer is, is uh, not a convenient one, and this is an executive decision to make. Uh, when you make business decisions, business decisions uh, often come with risk. So what risk will you tolerate? Do you want to delay uh, piggyback? Do you want to delay and go through competitive solicitation, which it sounds to me is inordinately long, that's uh, uncommon to me, uh, that it's six to eight months. But that's kind of where we're at. That, that's the legal landscape here. Uh, and I just wanted to make sure that the entire board knew of that. Mm -hmm. So the legal opinion that you gave to Dr. Legutko and um, Ms. Gann, you're now saying differently? You told them they legally no. were doing the correct thing. They went forward. But it sounds like now you're saying if they didn't give everybody the same opportunity, They've got to go back and redo it. Yeah. So I think which, that that's, which is it? that's been my same answer that I've given and trying to, if, yeah. if, if I gave you any, anything different, yeah. that's been my same <coughs> answer uh, okay. each time that I've spoken with, with everyone on this. So, because that's the law, and sometimes the law is inconvenient. So, Madam Chair, I do know that the Bailey Group is a, um, is a FSBA, um, they recommend them. On their website, as one of the like, if you're looking for vendors, okay. what that's worth. I just have a question. Has a question. So, if we were looking at piggybacking, what, what's the time frame for that? How long does that process take? I don't understand my question here. I know I'm looking at you. It's okay. <laughs> um, the, the, the only problem, sorry, to the chair, that with piggybacking, it may not be the same scope, sequence, and, and parameters that we established okay. and set. So um, they're in the process of obtaining what their contract is uh, from St. John's or some other surrounding counties to see if it's aligned. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it will be aligned. If it is, we can get it done fairly, fairly quickly. Um, it may, may be mm -hmm. different. And, and the only reason we expedited, and, and my question to legal was, is this lawful? And the answer is yes. Right. And with our timeline, I, teachers can't take a 26, 30 percent increase. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, through Mrs. Gann, emergency, you know, working to do this and for her informal work, I believe was completely standard. Her informal work, reaching out and giving the scope, the scope and sequence. My election for people to call me and want to meet with me is my own my meetings that I actually invited them so they can be a third party listening to it. it is nothing to do in re relation to 
um, we set up a presentation. No one was established to set up a presentation in this process. Uh, individuals reached out to me to, to meet. One was Roberts and someone. I took the meeting because I wanted to figure out more on insurance. The Bailey Group, which I didn't know the Bailey Group, reached out to me. Um, I met with them as well, and then I branched out. It wasn't a presentation, formal presentation to give to Mrs. Gann nor Dr. Lugucko. So for me, the scope and sequence was extended through the documentation through Mrs. Gann. My election to meet and invite them, maybe I shouldn't have invited you, but I'm glad you came because we had a professional conversation. So I still stand by the recommendation. I'm concerned about um, piggybacking on another district just because of what happened with the GPS and mm -hmm. that uh, mess. Yeah. But they, they, you know, the GPS is different because buses are buses, they transport kids. But health insurance, there's so many different. I know St. John's County has on site clinics, you know, we have wellness centers. So there's things that we, that they have that we don't. So there'd be things in their contract that probably wouldn't pertain to us. So I think if we're looking for the cleanest way to do it, I, I would probably rather see direct contracting or negotiating or whatever you want to call it if we have to do it that way. I will just say this whole thing bothers me that I feel like we're being so rushed and as a board we're being, um, and I, I understand, so I'm not pointing a finger and laying blame anywhere, but, you know, if this could have been approached six months ago and looked at, we as a board wouldn't be told this has to be approved because we've got to have it done by, you know, X date. And, and that, that bothers me, I feel like, because, and again, no, don't take this the wrong way, but because the district didn't prepare in advance, the board is now given one choice. You know, I mean, I almost feel like, didn't there used to be a committee that would do all of this first and then bring it forward? You know the insurance committee with that stuff, and and do all of that. Not the insurance committee. Can I, this is, can I respond yeah. to that? Not when you're dealing with a consultant. No, that's not a part of theirs. Because I did call Liz Crane, who was the chairman of the insurance committee, right. and she said, Sheila, that's not in not our scope. Okay. She said this is strictly okay. a district item, so okay. that's why right. I took it to yeah. Dr. Rebecca. Mm -hmm. Well, this just you know when I got the email. Um, and we all got the email. This right away, I thought, "Uh oh, what's going on here?" And so I appreciate you explaining step by step everything that's taking place. Um, and just also so you know, I, I want to make sure I address something that Mr. Daggett has said. Um, I feel like I gave every one of them equal time because I had direct conversations after the email was sent with Owen and Associates. As a matter of fact, Tim Owen and David Schneider both called me. I spent a lot of time answering all their questions. Um, Stacy Summerlin with the Summerlin and Roberts group, I spent time with them, as well did I with Gallagher. The only one that really didn't have as much time was the Bailey group, because I gave them such a short time, because I was trying to wrap this up, because I needed to get things moving. And as far as being rushed, I'm very sorry that any of y'all feel that way. I am just really trying to do what's best, and I think that making a change now it's the best thing to do, but if you opt to wait, I'm really good with that too. Just whatever you decide. But that's all on me, the rush, not the superintendent or Dr. Legutko. That's been on me trying to get this done and the ball rolling. And the reason it wasn't brought up before, honestly, just didn't come to my head until we started having questions on it. Because I have so many other things on my plate. I understand. Yeah. Thank you, Sheila. Does yeah. anyone else have any comments about this? I just really don't like the fact, aside from this, I don't like the fact that the Aon group tried to slide the uh, yeah. um, contract amendment in. Yeah. Really, yes, that uh, really feels underhanded yeah. with taxpayer dollars. I agree. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we waited. If, if any of y'all have questions, um, yes, we, I had a long conversation with yeah. some people yesterday <laughs> about this, and we went through it up, down, mm -hmm. in and out. Um, I, I want to state on the record, I have all the confidence in the world and she began and Bertie. Uh, they know what they're doing and I have a lot of faith in their work. Um, in hindsight, and I'm not saying anything I didn't say yesterday, it would have been my preference if they had had Gallagher at least come in and talk to them. It looks cleaner that way. but. I think the horse is out of the barn and going down the road, mm -hmm. and right now we're facing, what did you say, 29.3%? Yeah. Uh, we, we have to do something, and um, so y'all just 
think about it, you've got, what, within two days to ask questions and give into it and uh, uh, then make our best judgment. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. Uh, two things, and I'll uh, we'll adjourn. Uh, the first thing is I um, uh, want to thank Dr. Kemp and, and Daryl Sweat for what they're doing in transportation. Um, through GPS, they've saved the district $110,000 on GPS, and um, that's for holding them accountable. So that's $10,000 that goes back to our LCIF fund. So thank you for your hard work. And um, the second thing is please know that um, my strategy uh, in reference to either staff allocation, well, staff allocation is more cleanup and actually it's kind of neutral and indirectly. For department heads, it's not going to negate the fact that department heads work well. I'm trying to I'm trying to be an inclusive model and then also trying to find proactive ways so I can put money into insurance. So. Okay, a couple of things and then we can adjourn. I just want to ask a okay. question about transportation when he, when he said that. I'm not trying to point um, fingers or poke, but anyway, the phone calls have started, spring sports have started. So I thought you had told us last agenda review that we were at where we needed to be with bus drivers. And I know you said there was a training window and I mm -hmm. saw on the personnel yes, center agenda yes, we added some. But I'm, but I'm hearing from parents that they're still right. not drivers for field trips and not drivers for some of the earlier yeah. afternoon That's right. sports. Yeah. So I uh, brought that to the attention. I think last week we had a discussion with Dr. Kemp and Mr. Sweat that some individuals were scheduling uh, wrong, and they were scheduling for a 5.30 game to be picked up around 11 o'clock at noon. I'm like, no, it can't what? happen. Yes. And this example I gave because my daughter lived that a year ago. So... We're working rigorously to find, make sure we are attacking and addressing field trips and more athletic events so that we can continue our remainder of bus loop. And maybe it's a communication, because yeah. the, the parents that I've heard from, the coaches have just said, we're just not providing transportation this year. Yeah, and no. they aren't students who drive. Like, like yeah. you know, for instance, and part of it's my child's age, no, no, so okay. the JV parents call me because we have children the same age, but JV, Kids don't drive. Yeah, they need a bus. Players don't drive. High school needs a bus. But if they bus. play at four o'clock, right? They're, and what they've been told, some some of our schools, the parents who've called me, some of our schools have just been told we're not providing transportation yeah. again this year. So I agree. We'll do some communication with okay. with the uh, principals and let them know that everyone should be afforded the opportunity. We're not going to pick them up at eleven for a six o'clock ball game. Okay. So Thanks. thank you. Okay. I'm good. I'm good. I'm on the time thing now. All right. Ms. Leonard, um, I'd like to ask the school board to um, to choose their bargaining team um, ASAP because, as you know, our contract says we can't do anything about insurance if we've not decided by the end of the school year. That means that our employees will pick up this entire 29% if we don't do something about it. So we need to go back into bargaining as soon as possible because we need to do something about it. You want to talk to that, Mr. Brodsky? Sure, we can go ahead and, and come over the bargaining team and bring it forward to you. Yeah, as law requires you to, to appoint them, you need to put that on your agenda somewhere. Either well, I would that, you handle that? that? The April meeting? April meeting? I would, I would say the March agenda, if not the April agenda, because right. if not, that gives us exactly one month to find out what we're going to do about insurance. All this money we're saving in insurance, we should offer, should have something to be able to put on the table. Um, because if not, it stays status quo and it can't be changed. Okay, Mr. Brodsky said he will put it on the April meeting agenda. Right. Is that suitable? Yes, First Thursday in April? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Did anyone else say? Okay. Um, comments from the public today? Uh, yes. We're questions. We're almost questions. there. We're just questions. Oh, scoop. Well, next is scoop board comments. Um, I'll ask. Go ahead, Mr. Cooper. Okay. Mr. Christensen. Christensen. I'll take some his questions. Why is it that everything on your school board, on the school district website relating to public meetings, is essentially broken and doesn't work? I'll find okay. it. Okay. I have to use questions. Okay. We just launched our new websites today, so if it was anything from this morning, we're continually last updating. Yeah, it was last night. Correct. Okay, yeah. so this yeah. happened within the last 12 hours. Yeah. I got a call this morning to today's meeting. Yeah. yeah, we're working with Agenda yeah. Plus to get that all up. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. We're in our project. Okay. Now, again, there's a question. <coughs> I'm sorry. Yes, sir. All right, basically, 
and the school shooting a few weeks ago, school shootings are nothing new. The question then for is why don't you seem a little bit more concerned? I'm not entirely sure that the school security is really the conversation today didn't really inspire any confidence in, in me on this subject. I mean I see you're you know looking at me confused but I, I, I don't know how you can say that we don't seem to show that much concern. I, I'll bet you I know five ladies that shed some tears and and uh, we would love to do what we can. Yeah, through through the chair, through um, uh, Mr. Christian, I, I would say that uh, we have been on top of this as soon. I mean, I was at, I can tell you I was at the computer writing an email to this entire organization within hours because of the heartbreak about what we need to do to secure exterior except you know access, what we can do internally to secure, what we do if we see suspicious information, you know, individuals or activities. We have been can overly communicating. I have staff through Dr. Kim's staff going out and looking whether or not we can fence off certain locations of every school. We continue to have models of uh, making sure that we have up to date um, surveillance and entry points and one entry point. So, Mr. Barry, just also to your point, a lot of what we do that is security is, is we don't we don't talk about it. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. Because so. you don't want to tell somebody. Mm -hmm. All right. You know, there's That's some, things, that, there's some things we can we just will not. It's one of those things. things where you hope it's being taken care of, but yeah. you like to ask about. I'm sure you're redoing everything. Well, I did hear the, the idea today that it's, that, it's that, it's that, it's that it's silly to think fences stop people. Yeah. You know? but, but but I I don't think that there's a person in this school district who doesn't want to do everything, and we do not publicize some of the things that we do. But. Um, Rest assured, we are doing everything we humanly possibly can do. And safety will always be our first safety. priority. We want our children to be safe, and we want our employees to be safe. Anything else, Mr. Christensen? No, no. Okay. Um, this is simple. Ladies, if you would like new business cards, please raise your hand because Ms. Bush wants your name. I, I bought some. You don't want to so I'm good. Good. Are you, you want some? Three of us. Condon, Gilhausen, and me. I, when we went to Tallahassee, I had the old mail dot clay dot cake. I had well. that too. <laughs> okay. So I went uh, <laughs> and she wants to know the phone number you want on your cards. Okay. Can I interject something on that? Certainly. Point? I just wanted you guys to be aware. There's a an app you can put on your personal phone that um, Jeremy and his team helped me out to get set up with, and it gives you a district number. So it's the three three six. So you have like a desk line, so to speak. But You're kidding. It, no. It rings within the app on your personal phone, so mm -hmm. you can get those personal calls. And a lot of our principals and administrators have that app. Mm -hmm. And it's the neatest thing because you pull it up and you put in the search whoever's number you're looking for, and it pops right up. Huh. So you instantly have the contact list on your phone for everybody. In really? Yeah. Because some of us are still We've been doing it in the phone book. So <laughs> I, 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 I looked yeah. at it this morning when I, I looked at the number and I thought. A more comprehensive phone book. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 let, right. let me tell you, we appreciate, right. we appreciate that we got a phone book. But that is the worst phone book I have ever seen in my whole life. You cannot call <laughs> anybody. The numbers are missing. I mean, we'll want to call someone's secretary or someone. Uh, yeah. well, it is the worst this, thing I have ever, ever seen. <coughs> I can tell you. Oh, you don't know what the old ones were like. No, we're not the old ones. Oh, the app. I'm talking about the app. I'm talking about the old ones. Jeremy doesn't like to do things quickly. Okay. That phone book. We need to go back and model it towards some old phone books. Because it could. You can't. Find anybody. I'm supposed to have a cost of money, not the principal or the boss people. You can't find it. Doesn't them. even have the uh, principal secretary. No, I missed it. Yeah. The yeah, app no, no. is wonderful, and I'll tell you, I'm, I um, I need to get with you to make sure that my number is updated on the website. But I've, okay. I've disconnected Y'all. my district cell phone. And Carol's right. being recognized today. We've got to go. I've got uh, Master Board 20. I apologize. This if there's an insurance meeting in Gainesville on Thursday. Uh, what is that? What uh, is yeah, it? it if I was invited to come with Lena Lee, Sheila, Dr. Lugutko, Mr. Davis, he's not going to get Oh, come. you're talking about the policy workshop. Uh, but the, that, that's the reason I canceled this meeting that we were to have on Thursday. So we need to get our calendars out and find a new day 
works for the next policy workshop. If y'all are you going to bring us back the information that you get from that? This this is just. Uh, I arranged this, this insurance meeting this is the last one um, because I want to know how they got a fourteen million dollar fund balance in three years yeah. and um, insurance fund balance. So I had asked their counterpart. So I asked the chairman of the board, the superintendent, um, Ms. Scan, Ms. Legecko, and Alachua supplying their counterparts. Okay. And, and certainly I'll tell you what I learned there. Yeah. But because of the sunshine and this potentially being something that might come before the board, we don't want to. No, no, no. I was just was wondering sunshine. if you would bring us back whatever you learned. If I learned it, if I learned it, I'll be glad to. I think you'll learn a lot, actually. Okay. All right. I'm available March 21st, Wednesday. When is spring break? 14th, I believe. The 12th. 12th. Yeah. Actually, through the 19th because of teacher planning. Yeah. Right. Just too early. Why'd we jump to the end of March? Well, because spring break is there. I'm not here the week of November. Is anybody available next week? What about, I mean, well, next we week is our school board, board meeting. First. Tuesday. Tuesday the 6th. Tuesday morning, the 27th. Uh, the 27th. Uh, I'm not I'm the TTC. I got the TTC. Or the 26th. <laughs> I have the TTC on the 6th. I'm the mail the 26th in the morning. The 28th is fine. Right. Well, it depends on how long y'all want to meet. I'm good Friday the 2nd. I met her at 11.30 on Monday. Yeah, we have to be out early on Monday. I'm Tuesday, Monday. We've got regular readings. Oh, you're out. Yeah. Yeah. So the first week's not good to marry. The second week's not good for me. Yeah. Yeah. Which puts us to the 21st. What about the 28th? Is everybody busy on What about the week of the 19th? I'm the 28th. What about February 28th, which is the first half? No. Well, well, or the morning of the 28th. We were looking at a two-hour meeting. Actually, they want, somebody wanted three hours. Right? Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. The 27th. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 March 21st, March 21st, and Friday the 2nd is back, Friday's back? Friday the 2nd, I can see you, I, in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. I can see March 21st, I'm working with, what's your calendar, because she's working on March 21st, so you'll want to invite us. What about Friday the 2nd? March 2nd. Is anybody going to the Cyber Security Forum for FSBA on Friday the 2nd? That would be the only one to go. Not quite, but I don't know if anybody can hear you guys. Look at that meeting. It's I'm not in. The the second. Yeah. 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 The second. 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 March 20th at 9, and we took nine, two hours. 9 to 11.30. Lunch at Tuesday. Tuesday, March 20th. March 20th. And that would be 9 to 11.30. And we'll meet here. Oh, wait a minute. This that, afternoon, you can go all the way to the Oh, so that's the fair luncheon that day, so we won't have room. They have this. We can do that, and I can take luncheon. everyone to lunch. <laughs> We're all going to go to the fair luncheon right. that day. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Bush. Well, that's, 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 that's right. We can watch that. We can work all morning, and I can take everyone to lunch. It's the fair luncheon at 11, 30 or 12. I have it on 12. Oh, I think we're here. It's usually 12. We have the official invitations here. I'm sorry. They gave me the day. Can we meet? It's usually 12. We'll get home, and then we're here. Lunch is all yeah, we'll do everything. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. so generous. Okay. Um, all right, Ms. Bush.
have I forgotten anything? Let's see. The uh, Master Board, I mean, uh, and don't forget the Master Board training is at 29 from 8.30 to 3.30, and we do have the uh, TTC reserved, and, and uh, Mr. Davis, I'm really looking forward to you sitting with us for all those hours. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Whatever you need from me. Okay. Day. Is there any other business to come before the board? Anybody got any comments? Okay, meeting adjourned. That's our new website, by the way. Can you scroll it up? Can you scroll it up on that website?